Hey guys, this is Frank Yetter, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Hey, this is Rich Franklin. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben. This is Diego Sanchez. Randy Couture. Alistair Overeem. Hi, this is Stephen Bonner. This is Don Fry. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. TJ Dillashaw. And you're listening to Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. You're listening to Submission Radio. Welcome to another episode of Submission Radio. It's the 27th of March on the week of our second year anniversary, Casper. Two years of Submission Radio. It's flown by so quick. Man, super, super fast. Yeah, officially on the 22nd of March of 2014, the first ever episode of Submission Radio happened. I, I can't believe it's already been two years. I just, we want to say a massive, massive thank you to all the fans and all the listeners that have been supporting us this whole time. I really do feel like it's a family almost, especially because we get to, uh, you know, it's so back and forth and we get to chat to you guys over social media and throughout the comments. So a massive, massive thank you to to all the listeners. If it's your first time listening, welcome. And as we've always said, the best is yet to come. So a, a massive two years thus far. That's right. A massive two years and a big, big show here on the heels of UFC Brisbane. We've got some fun guests for everybody. First on the program, we've got Dan Kelly. He's going to come on and talk about his massive win at UFC Brisbane. Jake Matthews is going to be on the program, Juliana Pena, and of course, the man behind Nate Diaz's boxing, Richard Perez. And when it comes to breakdowns and discussions, we've got a very special guest as well, Cass. Yeah, first time on the show, Luke Thomas is going to be joining us. Uh, I, I do feel like this is long, long overdue. People have been asking us to get Luke Thomas on the show for a long time. So this is like worlds colliding, much like Batman vs. Superman. But we're going to be talking about that a little bit later on, reviewing Batman vs. Superman, the uh, movie that it was. And uh, just letting you know, some of the things we'll be talking about with Luke Thomas, I mean, there's these crazy rumors that the UFC is being sold to an overseas company. We're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about UFC Brisbane, some of the controversy there. Diaz McGregor 2, Mark Hunt, a whole bunch of stuff to talk to uh, Luke Thomas about. As always, don't forget, if you are feeling super generous, don't be afraid to give us a review on iTunes. If you want to go over there and uh, you know, give us a review, give us however many stars you think we're worth, it does help the show, it does support the show, and it makes iTunes look at the show and go, hey, people are reviewing this. This obviously isn't a crap show. It's a decent show, which is you know, hopefully the way you guys see it. If you haven't subscribed, definitely subscribe. We've got some great content on the channel at the moment. I believe we've got a sexy video with Frank Mead, don't we, Dennis? Yeah, that's right. It's one of those pieces where we do a lot of great interviews, but this is one of the ones we're most proud of. It's called Team Frank Mir, getting to know Team Frank Mir. And even though there are a few questions about how he'll do against Mark Hunt, the majority of the interview is about getting to know the team behind him, Ricky Lindell, uh, James Horn, and of course, Angelo Reyes. So make sure to check it out because you guys have never seen Team Frank Mir have these kinds of conversations where you really get to hear about some of the weird fascinations like insects, uh, why Ricky Lindell isn't the best driver, and just some of the crazy stuff that goes on behind the scenes. So we sat down with it and we had so much fun. Make sure to check it out. It sort of fell at an unfortunate time. It just came out right before the fight. So not that many people got a chance to watch it, but it's still up there. It's still relevant. So check it out. I think you guys will really enjoy it. Yeah, and while you're checking things out, don't forget to check out the most recent technique of the week with Robert Whitaker and his coach, Henry Perez. It's a triple kick combination, one that we've been getting a lot of good reviews uh, from. And just in general, our Robert Whitaker videos, we've got some more Robert Whitaker content coming up this coming week, I believe any day now. And just letting you know, we will be taking a very short break uh, with the technique of the week. It'll be back rather soon. But if you are finding that you want some new techniques, feel free to check out some of the old ones because in our library, we've got a ton of old techniques that we've uh, been doing over the last couple of years. I think we're getting pretty close to 100 techniques now. So if you are wanting to sharpen up your arsenal, there are plenty of techniques to look over. And with that, guys, we are going to be jumping to our first guest. And Dennis, I believe he's on the line. Our next guest had a moment of the night at UFC Brisbane for submission radio when he overcame Antonio Carlos Jr. by beating him by TKO in the third round to a roaring Brisbane crowd, a four-time judo Olympian and a contestant of Tough Nations. You may also recognize him from Submission Radio's Technique of the Week. Dan Kelly, welcome back to Submission Radio. How are you? Very good. Thank you very much for having me, guys. It's great to finally have you on the show, especially because we've done so much in-person stuff and now you're on the show. So officially, welcome to the program. Before we get into the fight and your win, we're going to talk about celebrations. It's been a week now. Tell us, how did the Kelly family celebrate and what did they do to celebrate this massive win? Uh, to be honest, this time we didn't do that much. Uh, I've got three days off now, so we're just going to sit down, relax and um, enjoy a bit of time together because it's been pretty hectic around here over the last few months. Mm. 
Well, we know you've had some big moments in your athletic career in judo, being at the Sydney Olympics, but did the moment when you beat Antonio trump all those experiences for you? Um, yeah, it was big. It was big. I mean, probably the biggest because it's the freshest in my mind. Uh, and I was such a massive underdog. So, yeah, that, that was one of the biggest ones. Then I celebrated like a crazy man as well. So. You, don't, you don't sound very very convinced that it's your biggest moment. Are we getting the truth here, Dan? Biggest moment or not? Give it to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, it's just hard. I mean, it's, I, I get asked a lot about the comparison between my Olympic career and, and, and the UFC. And I think the UFC is a little bit more uh, emotionally draining than the Olympics and the judo stuff was. And so probably the biggest moments are coming now. But, I mean, I was eight years old when I first dreamt about qualifying and going to an Olympic. So it's, it's, it's weird. It's a weird, weird situation for me in terms of what meant more, what felt bigger and all that kind of thing. Yeah, they're, they're big in their own ways. Uh, you've got a great gym in Footscray, Melbourne called Resilience Training Centre. What was the reaction like from your students? Was it a bit of a hero's welcome? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we had a little bit of a party on Monday night. They were really... Really happy. All those guys get right behind me. Uh, all my training partners do. I'm lucky that I can do everything in Australia. And yeah, they that, that, that were wrapped. They were really, really happy. Yeah, I'm seeing like the parade that Holly Home got in Albuquerque, except it's just like in the Resilience Training Center when you come in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I don't think enough of Footscray know about uh, mixed martial arts or anything like that. Could be a good thing, Dan. A lot of- yeah, true. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it was that they were wrapped, and it was good. We're at just a small little gym, we're a small team, and yeah, to, to get to get results like that against uh, you know, people from uh, massive gyms like ATT has been really good. So, thirty years old, and with a ton of previous injuries, how did your camp go into this fight with Antonio? Was it was it all, was it all smooth good. sailing? Um, oh, there's always niggles, and thank you for saying I'm only 30 years old. I appreciate that. Um, it's, uh, my body held together okay. I had um, some lingering injuries coming into it, but not what everyone does. Um, mixed martial arts is a lot easier on my body than judo was training-wise, and I was I was pretty fit for this fight. Uh, I was happy with the pace that I could put on, especially after the first round. And, yeah, no, nah, um, my, body, my body's pretty good. I've got a bit of a bruise on my leg, but I could start training again next week, no trouble at all. Well, Dan, I'm going to be the unpopular one here and correct Casper saying that you're 38 years old. I mean, there's a lot of stuff 30, going against you in this fight and people saying that Antonio is better than you in all areas, you, you being a big underdog. What did you think about all the odds and the comments from the people going into this one? Uh, I, I I love them. I, I, like, I like being the underdog. Um... Everyone writes me off every fighter. He's striking shit. He's not going to be. He's not going to be able to keep up physically. The other guy's going to have better cardio. He's more athletic. I hear it all the time. So I read it and go, okay, that's good. That's another one like that, and keep carrying on because it hasn't affected me adversely yet. So, but I was a massive underdog for this fight. No one gave me a snowflake chance in hell. Uh, he's got heavier hands than me. Apparently, um, he's going to come over the top of me with cardio later in the fight. And, Neither of those things happened. Nothing he hit, he hit me with hurt me, and he was he was knackered at the end of the fight. Like he, he didn't want to be there. So mm. yeah, no, they can keep saying whatever they like. Luckily, you guys are good. You guys are always nice to me. So it's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course, we have to be nice to Dan Kelly. We saw improved striking at Melbourne at UFC 193, and in Brisbane, we saw your heart and determination. You know, Antonio had did he did have some success in the first round. What was going through your mind at that point in the fight, especially when he was going for those chokes? About the body triangle was well locked. He wasn't that physically strong, but he's very slippery in jiu-jitsu. And once he had the body the body triangle on, after about two minutes of fighting his hands and him not getting me, I, I kind of resigned myself to the fact that if he's not going to open the triangle, body triangle to go for something else, then I was probably going to lose around and just uh, have to wait it out and try not to let him take my back in the second round. And that was it. My, my, my corner were talking to me the whole time. I wasn't really... In, in a lot of danger at any stage there. I was just being controlled well, and he wasn't really pushing that hard for the finish either. With the body triangle off, you can only go from weird naked choke anyway. Mm-mm. Well, describe that moment for us in the third round where you obviously uh, beat Antonio. It's a huge roar from the Brisbane Entertainment Center, and for the record, it was the loudest of the night by far. Describe the feelings going through your body at that moment. What was the first thing you thought about? Talk us through it, Dan. <laughs> it was the... Uh... 
I lost time to be honest. Uh, when I when I heard him with the with the head kick and then he I sprawled on his takedown and started punching. I thought, no, nah, I can't let him up. I'll keep hitting him. And he he was starting to moan a little bit under the punches. And then I was just I lost time. I don't even remember what I said to uh, John Anik after the fight. I had to go back to my corner out the back and say, well, what did I just say? Because and they were just laughing at me. They thought it was hilarious, but <laughs> it was just so massive. Not even a massive relief. Just really. Really, really happy. Really, really happy. Because it, t- it was a tough fight. It was a tough fight mentally, more so than physically. And, and I was just, I was wrapped to come through it like that. And yeah, I, lo- I lost time. That's how uh, emotionally happy, <laughs> happy I was. Sounds like a, an amazing experience to sort of go through. And we, while we couldn't quote you, I do remember it being a good promo. And uh, the cr- the crowd in the UFC, they won't phone it in. And the crowd was really behind you when you got on the mic. So it, it, whatever you said, it was good. Dan, tell us about Dad's Army. What exactly is it? Well, I mean, obviously, you know Dad's Army's from um, the the Australian cricket team years and years ago. They played England. They're all older. I, it's all my pretty much all my main training partners are dads. They're all <laughs> all older guys. My coaches are dads. Um, yeah, so I just thought, you know what? We'll we'll just put the hashtag Dad's Army there and just show that. Us older guys, us dads can still get out there and, and make a splash in the uh, MMA world. Yeah, I think the Resilience Training Center needs some dad's army T-shirts. But is it true that in a lot of ways <laughs> you're seen like a father figure to Aussie fighters like Jake Matthews and Richard Walsh? Yeah, I don't know how that happened. I mean, we're all <laughs> equals in the house. Um, <laughs> uh, but look, I'm, I'm, it's funny. Jake and, Jake and his dad, Mick, who are very close and they're very good friends of mine, I'm a lot closer to Jake's dad's age than I am to Jake's. I mean, Mick's 46, Jake's 21. So there's only eight years between myself and Mick. So we actually get along really, really well as well. But yeah, I've, I've, if I can set a good example for these guys and for my judo athletes in, in just the way I go about things, and, and I'm not the most skillful guy in the world, but I'm, you know, I'm dedicated, I work hard, I don't give up in fights, then, then, and then I'm happy. And I mean, the, the the whole MMA scene down in Melbourne is, is growing and we're going to see a lot more guys in the uh, UFC soon, I think. Mm, which is something that we're very happy about. This card, <clears throat> excuse me, this card saw some really tough matchups for the Aussies. Did you feel like in a lot of ways it was set up to see how Aussie MMA fares against top Brazilian and US competitors? Absolutely. It was a big step up for everyone. I mean, all, all four of us who were uh, in the tough nations with Brendan, uh, Rich, Jake, and myself—we all had really hard matchups compared to what we've had before. So, yeah. I'm, and I, I relish those opportunities because that that shows and puts your stamp. That that's where you belong. We belong in the UFC, and, and I think I proved that now. Mm. Well, after UFC 183, you admitted retirement was on your mind before you went over Steve Montgomery. Now you're in a two-fight win streak. Dad's army is definitely rolling. What do you want next? What's your ultimate goal? Uh, I'm, I'm, my aim when I go into the UFC was 10 fights. I'm halfway mm. there now, but I'm, I'm not going to put a limit on it. My body feels pretty good. and I'm showing that I can fight against better and better guys. <clears throat> uh, I won't fight again probably until the end of the year because I've got, I've got some commitments with uh, Olympic judo. And the year after that, I want to, I want to see how far I can go. I want to, I don't want to limit myself. If you start putting limits on yourself, it's not a good thing because you can hit a ceiling. Whereas if I go, you just ride, ride this pony as far as we can, that's what I'm going to do. Oh, yeah. Ride it for sure. I'm just wondering, is that tough, though? Because you're going to be doing things with the with the judo team for Rio de Janeiro for the Olympics. Um, is it going to be tough considering it's the start of the year and you're already sort of ruling out another fight this year? <clears throat> I committed to this job and I'm happy to do it. I don't think it's going to matter that much. I mean, I'm experienced enough that fighting at the end of the year and, and hopefully again in Australia, that, that'll be fine. And then the year after, we can push on and have three fights. For me, being a little bit older, three fights a year is more than enough. Mm-hmm. You're giving us a few hints here, Dan. November, is there a potential fight there with Ronda Rousey that you're trying to hint at? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think... I, I Look, I really hope that they put another show on later in the year in Melbourne. In Australia, anyway, it'd be fine, but in Melbourne, but I, I don't think we'll, uh, we'll get a, a stadium show or a numbered show again this year. I think it'll be another fight night. Look, we can, we can dream and hope because uh, <laughs> Eddie Had Stadium was awesome, but mm. yeah, I reckon we'll get another fight night. And there's enough, um, there's enough guys pushing up uh, in terms of rankings with like, oh, Mark Hunt's always there. Rob Whittaker's going up. Jake's going up. But 
that we can put on a really exciting card with, uh, you know, just local guys on the uh, main card as well. Yeah, and Dan Kelly's going up as well. So don't leave yourself out of that list. We want a big matchup for you too. Now, finally, before we finish this off, you let slip at the press conference and just before about how you'll be working with the judo team for Australia and Rio. As we finish up this interview, give us a few future superstars. Give us a few names of future superstars that you believe have a good shot at a medal in Rio. Uh, Rio, <clears throat> Rio, for a lot of our guys, I don't think will be a good chance at, at medals because a lot of the team's young. Mm-hmm. I think uh, towards Tokyo, they're going to be a better chance. I mean, judo's a really hard sport. And in, luckily, this time, we've got a very young team coming through. I, I think they'll be better for the experience this time. We may get a few surprise results. But overall, I think everything's working towards Tokyo in 2020. Uh, we had a lot of older ones retire after 2012. I think uh, another four years after this, we'll actually have a couple of people who potentially could really, really be cracking the international scene judo was. Wow. And do you think you'll be doing, uh, I guess, the honours and training them for twenty uh, for, for Tokyo? Oh, I've got no idea. I've got no idea. We'll see how um, we'll see how Rio goes. And then, obviously, the UFC stuff is, uh, is a high priority for me personally as well. We'll see. I, I've, I've got no idea at the moment. We'll just, just get through Rio, get through the end of the year fight, and then we'll see what happens from there. All right. Well, we we appreciate the honesty. Fans in Australia, make sure to check out Dan's Gym Resilience Training Center. You can find out more information by going to resiliencetrainingcenter.com. We've seen it firsthand. It's an amazing facility. And join Dan's army now by following Dan on Twitter, at Dan Kelly Judo. Dan, it's your first time on the show, but I feel like I should say it's always a pleasure because every time we see you, uh, we, have, we have a great chat. So thank you so much for coming on. Nah, thanks for having me, guys. Really appreciate it. Hi guys, it's Jana Jacek, UFC strawweight champion. Listen to Submission Radio. All right, guys, our next guest is the current number five ranked UFC bantamweight. She's the season 18 Ultimate Fighter winner, a one time performance of the night winner, and always great to chat to the Venezuelan vixen Juliana Pena. Welcome back to Submission Radio. How's it going today, Juliana? Good. How are you guys doing? Well, very, very well. Now, before we talk about the crazy world of MMA, we saw you last November for UFC 193. Let's forget MMA for a second. Give us the rundown. How was your time in our great country here in Australia? Um, I absolutely loved it. I was treated like a queen. I met some amazing, (laughs) great friends that I'll never forget. And uh, I want to go back so bad. I can't wait to, to go back and to actually spend some more time you know, visiting the country. I didn't get to see a kangaroo, so that kind of made me sad. But I'll be back. I will be back. Yeah, I don't. you're like the Terminator. You'll be back. And I don't know if it's a real uh, trip to Australia if you haven't seen any kangaroos. You are doing some promo events for the UFC. Did you actually get a chance to explore Melbourne or, or any other cities? Did you hang around the country afterwards? Uh, no, I, I left the next day uh, after the event. I, I didn't get a good chance to, to do anything much besides shopping, and, and I got to hang out on the on the rooftops, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, no, certainly. People sort of compare Melbourne to Canada in a lot of ways. I'm just wondering, what was your take on Melbourne? What did, what did, what did it remind you of? Oh, it, it reminded me of a place that I've never been to before. It was so <laughs> beautiful, and just the city structure in itself, uh, you know, it uh, kind of had like a New York feel, but cleaner, mm. and the water was right there. Um, like I said, there were so many chefs that, you know, invited me to restaurants. I went to Maha, and uh, I, I just had such a, a great time. I The friends that I met, I drove around in a Ferrari. Wow. They, yeah, it was a Ferrari. It wasn't a Lamborghini. I mean, I made some amazing friends, and, and they all treated me um, so well. They wouldn't let me pay for a thing, and uh, they were really great company and, and really funny, too. So I just enjoyed Australia so much, so much. I can't wait to go back. Wow, it's not the Australia that we know. No, I'm just kidding. There's great people here. What's, <laughs> what's a funny story that you remember from your time here real quick? Any Anything crazy happen? Um, I really liked walking down the streets with the uh, graffiti art because there's like tons. There's like a, it's like a village. Mm. And it's like you walk in, in, in the um, alleyways and there's just so much art. And, and I was walking with all the UFC uh, uh, employees and we were just having funny stories and taking pictures of the ones that we connected with the most. So it was a great time. Yeah, it's interesting. We had a Banksy, but I believe someone painted over it, the crazy, crazy people here in Australia. Now, the last few months saw your fighting career get put on hold due to some legal troubles. We know you can't give any specific details about the case because it's currently pending, but can you give us an update on how you're traveling and when can we expect to see you back in the octagon? 
Um, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly, but I, I know it's going to be sometime, uh, you know, in, in, uh, some months, you know, so maybe sometime in the summer, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, so I'm just waiting, waiting to, to hear when, I, when my next fight is going to be announced. I know that my, uh, legal issues are resolved and, uh, I'm just now waiting for the UFC to, to announce my next fight. Just to clarify, did you say they are resolved already as in it's all, it's all done. The court case has happened. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm just curious. Are you able to talk about uh, sort of the incident or is it still under wraps? Um, you know, it's it's still under wraps. It's just something that I, I would rather put behind me. What I will say is that the matter was resolved and, and it's all taken care of now. So I, I didn't have to go to court. You know, I had a, a really great lawyer to, to take care of things for me and, and it's over and done with. Mm. Now, you've said many times, hashtag Dana till I die. How did you find UFC support for you around this sort of difficult situation? Uh, they supported me uh, extremely well, and I am so grateful to be working for the UFC. Um, you know, they were very much aware of the situation, and, and they just made it so that I knew that if I needed anything at all, that I could come to them mm. and, and to um, bring any trouble that I might have uh, to them and that they would assist me with anything, and, and they did do that. And um, I'm just so grateful for them as a company and to be working under under them, and I'm, I'm very blessed and grateful for that. Um, having such a great employer like them. Mm. I was going to say, you've already had your career put on hold in 2014 due to injuries. Now that happened. How hard was it for you to be out on the sidelines again, knowing that you had momentum and the fact that, you know, you, I guess at one point you weren't going to be fighting until around June. Maybe now it it might be a little bit earlier. Um, No, I I might even be a little bit later. I I really don't know when, you know. Um, I just continue to train and continue to work hard and, and put my time in on the mat every day. And, uh, when, when they call me, I'll be ready, you know? So I'm just waiting for for that time. I'm not too worried about it in the grand scheme of things, as far as fighting every other month or something like that, you know, when they want me to fight, they'll let me know and I'll let them know and we'll come to an agreement. Mm. Well, let's go back down to Melbourne. When the UFC brought you out here in November for UFC 193, it really seemed like they wanted to potentially start promoting you around the next title shot. And you even joked about jumping to the cage and challenging the winner. Then Holly, of course, beat Ronda and everything got turned upside down. When you look back at that, do you think that if Ronda beat Holly like most people expected, you may have already fought for the belt? Maybe not have fought for it, but at least have been next in line. Um depending on how quick Ronda was wanting to get back in, in the cage. There was no need for me to storm the cage, though, because Ronda didn't win. Um, but, yeah, I think that answers your question, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you, when you were sitting cage side at that fight before Ronda lost, were there any plans to call Ronda out? And did the UFC say anything to you about, you know, getting in the cage afterwards or anything like that? I'm sure they didn't want me to. Um, the thing is, is that I made a joke about storming the cage and everyone took it pretty literally. So <laughs> when the fight was over, I was sitting in the very front row. And when the fight was over, there was a barricade in front of me. And I was literally levitating over the barricade. <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden I was floating to the cage. And then I was at the cage and I was on the cage. And I got video of me on the cage and being like, I'm next, I'm next. Um, but it was funny because... I didn't throw myself over the barricade. It was like everybody that was even like four rows back were like picking me up and throwing me over. And they're like, get in there, you know? So I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was just kidding. And then I was at the cage and I was like, how did, how did it get to this? And so I just stood on the cage and was like, hey, I'm next in line. Give me the shot. And uh, I don't think anybody heard me. Shocker. So. Mm. Wow, that's crazy. She actually got to the cage. I didn't know about this. I guess the cameras were panning to the other side. Wow, okay. Yeah, and uh, Dana Dana looked at me inside the cage, and I said, hey, I'm next. And he said, hey, go back to your seat. (laughs) He said, fine. Well, let's fast forward to almost a month ago when Misha defeated Holly Holm, and once again, the division got a new champion. You predicted this via Twitter, but you were rather quiet after she got the victory. What was your reaction to Misha beating Holly and becoming the new champion? Oh, I was so stoked. Um, you know, I was there and I was screaming at her. I, I don't know. It, it, for those of you that do not know, I have a loud voice and uh, it is a 
um, megaphone, if you will. <laughs> and so you could put me in the nosebleeds and, and my training partner will be fighting in the cage and you will hear me from the nosebleeds. Like, let's put it that way. Um, and so I was screaming at her and I was telling her to, to go for it. And, and she went for it. I'm, I'm so proud of Misha. I, I told her before the fight that she was going to do that. Um, I told everybody before the fight that she was going to do that. And then she did it. And so I, I couldn't be more, more happy for her. She, she deserves it. She's worked hard. She's, uh, the first female fighter that I ever met and that I ever knew and that I ever looked up to. So it's, it's definitely well-deserved and, and I'm very happy for, for her making that a reality once again now we're personally not big on immediate rematches especially considering how often they seem to be happening these days but a lot of people feel like because holly spent so much time dominating the fight she should get an immediate rematch against misha what do you think does a rematch make sense in your opinion um i don't know i i, I don't really like rematches that much just because it's like you know, you had that time to, to do it and you didn't do it then. So I, I'm not a big fan on, on rematches, but you know, the UFC is a machine and they're about selling tickets and putting butts in those seats. So if that's what they think is going to, you know, sell the most, then I suggest doing that. I personally don't agree with it. Um, but that's probably because I'm biased and then I want my shot at the title. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it is one of those situations where either Holly Holm gets the rematch against Tate or Tate waits around for Ronda Rousey. If, Hol if Holly doesn't get that immediate rematch, is she someone that you're gunning for for your potential next fight? Um, I mean, it's kind of like a it's a question of, of who I'm going to fight next is kind of very interesting for everyone. You know, mm. all these girls... Um, have all fought each other and they've all fought and beat each other and they've all had this, you know, sort of round robin deal, but they haven't beaten me. And so it's kind of like, a, I'm just waiting for them to tell me who it is and then I'll say, okay, let's go. You know, I don't care uh, who they want me to fight or, you know, none of these girls to me are like, you know, oh crap, you know, I, I don't want to take the fight or, you know, nervous feelings or anything like that. I'm, I'm ready to go and I'm ready to fight whoever that they want me to. So, um, if they want me to fight Holly, I'll fight Holly. Whoever they want me to fight, let's do it. Well, when looking at Misha's next opponent, people are throwing names out there like Ronda, Holly, you know, Amanda Nunes, even Kat Zingano, or, or even Chris Cyborg. Do you feel like your name got lost in the mix a little bit? No, I don't. I just watched an interview today where Misha mentions me herself as a possible contender um, to, to for her next fight, you know. So I feel like she knows that. A lot of people that are diehards know that. Maybe not um, the casual fan because all they know is Ronda and, and, and Conor McGregor and that's it. But I feel like, you know, I, I'm the secret shopper. I'm that one that everybody's sleeping on. And, and when it is my turn, that then they will know who I am. And, and I'm just... Um, anticipating that moment and I'm anticipating that time. Mm, well, you and Misha are actually pretty close. She was your coach on The Ultimate Fighter. There's a relationship there. I'm just curious, if you did get the title shot and Misha was still the champion, would that complicate things at all for you guys? And have you ever discussed between the two of you what would happen in that scenario? Uh, yes, we have. We we discussed it. We've discussed it several times, and and we discussed it primarily right after I won the Ultimate Fighter. And uh, because we're friends, the deal was the only conditions that we would fight each other would be is if she has the belt or if I have the belt. And now that she has the belt, I I know that she's aware that that was the agreement that we had. Uh, decided on and so i think that it's just now a matter of who uh they decide who her next fight is whether she's going to wait for ronda or if she's going to say you know she wants to take a fight against somebody else and if they want to put me in that title shot i would love that i would love nothing more than that but uh if they want me to fight one more and then fight for the title then i'll do that too um that's the impression that i'm under is that they want me to fight one more time before i get my shot at the title and uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. But again, like I said, I'm biased. Yeah, no, certainly, right. Uh, I'm just wondering, have you had a chance to chat to Misha since she won the title? I know she's been over here in Australia. We saw her in Brisbane last week. But have you had a chance to chat to her? And has she mentioned to you that she'd like for you to be possibly her next or her first uh, defense, her first title defense? Um, well, I was at her after party, so we hung out uh, at her after party, and mm -hmm. it was just all a celebration. I was very happy for her, um, and I I believe she was saying that she was going to fight Ronda next or a rematch with, with Holly and then uh, possibly Amanda Nunes and stuff like that. So, you know, 
I'm just kind of like, I feel like uh, I don't need to be uh, so loud and boisterous because my time is going to come, you know what I mean? And it's almost like a let, let the buildup happen before you rush things because I think that will be a lot sweeter. And uh, I know that it's a fight that everybody wants to see as well. So if it builds up more and more and more, the better for me. The more fights sell, the the, the bigger the venue is. It's, it's, it's more eyes watching me fight. So if that's the way that it plays out, then that would be great too. Well, you mentioned Amanda Nunes, and people are talking about her potentially getting the next shot. She beat the tough Valentina Shevchenko at UFC 196, but you know it wasn't the type of fight that had people jumping up and down for her to get the next shot. What do you think? Do you think that she did enough to earn a, a shot at the belt? I know you're pretty biased, but I'm just curious what you think. Uh, I fell asleep. Uh, I was there live, and I was waiting for them to fight. I felt like they were point sparring and just dinking around up until she finally, you know, got her to the ground. I was like, what are we watching here? Is this a fight or they, you know, is this a point sparring match? What's going on? And uh, so, yeah, I don't necessarily think that it was some fight that jumped off the pages for me, Um, but it is what it is. And uh, a win is a win. Certainly right now. Amanda Nunes obviously up the top of the division with yourself. There's a good possibility she could be your next fight. I'm just wondering, how would you see a matchup against her going? What would what would you think the outcome would be? Against me and Amanda? Yeah. Mm. I, I, I would win. I, I would beat all these girls. Like I said, they've all beat each other, all in the top five. They've all fought each other. They've all beat each other. They have not beat me. I'm I just... have yet to be beaten in the UFC octagon. I'm just wondering, you've said multiple times that obviously the UFC have told you that you need one more fight before you get that shot. Um, and it's, you, you say it doesn't make sense to you, but you, do you still feel like that's the case and it, you might get a surprise where you need two more fights just because of timing? Because it seems like if you fight around J- July, June, May, the time frame would allow for a late-year title fight, but then you've got Ronda's potential return, which probably guarantees her a title shot. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, you know what I mean? It's, they, they, they're they always pulling tricks out of the hat and throwing, you know, wrenches into the mix. And so, you know, the, the to me, nothing is ever certain until it's written down on paper. And then until it's written down on paper, that's the only time that I'll be like, oh, I'm for sure fighting, you know, and, and it's mm-hmm. for sure a done deal. Uh, until then, it's all speculation, you know. I, I really hope that that was not the case. I feel like I keep screaming from the top of my lungs, give me a title shot uh, after every fight. And so I, I can't imagine that they would deny me again uh, when I win my next fight. So th- it'll be very interesting to, to see how those cards play out. I hope to God that they don't. Mm. Let's just quickly talk about that matchup for a second. Ronda Rousey versus Misha Tate, number three. I mean, a lot of people still believe Rousey would be the person that beats Tate. Uh, You predicted that Tate would beat home. How do you predict this fight would go between Rousey and Tate for the third time? Uh, You know, I've always had belief and and extreme faith in in Misha uh, as a fighter. And, um, you know, the first time she fought Ronda, I said, Misha's going to win. And then the second time she fought Ronda, I said, Misha's going to win. So if they fight for a third time, I'm going with my girl Misha for sure. Let's say somehow you do get the next shot against Misha. You always say the UFC pulling tricks. How would you see that fight going? Uh, Against me and Misha? Correct, yeah. Oh, what a treat that would be for you guys. (laughs) I'll, I'll leave it at that. Wow, okay. So there's a lot of build-up going on. Now, uh, let, let us quickly ask you about the training situation. We didn't really get a chance to find out what's been going on with you through all these difficult times. Is it safe to say that you've been in the gym preparing for a fight all this time, or have you taken a little bit of a break in your preparation because of everything that's been going on? No, I, I've been training. You know, I just got back from a month uh, a month and a half over in Chicago training with uh, Luis Claudio, who's uh, Hicks and Gracie Black Belt. So uh, I've been training. I'm back home right now. I'm getting ready to go back out to Chicago here shortly. And uh, I've just been trying to get ready and stay ready, you know. We know that Luis Claudio, he trains Ben Rothall. I'm just wondering, did you train with Ben Rothall uh, as well or just Luis? I I sure did, yeah. They live about uh, like 30 minutes from each other. So I was in between both gyms. Oh, what was that like training with Big Ben? He taught me a very important lesson about the word perfect. And, uh, you know, when you when you say the word perfect, that implies that there's no room to grow and that you can't be better than what it is because it's perfect. And so I've 
completely eliminated that word from my vocabulary. I know that perfect doesn't exist, and you can always get better than than what it was before. You can always do better than what you did before, you know. And so I know that there's room to grow, and I know that I'm not perfect. And so I just I, I love that. I learned uh, some some very valuable lessons from Ben, and he was just so gracious. Him and his wife Jennifer, they have a beautiful gym in Kenosha, and uh, they were just open open arms to me, and uh, you know gave me some sweatpants, fed <laughs> me with his mom's cooking. And uh, it was just a really, really great time to, to actually be around, you know, another UFC fighter who is, has such a great um, caliber of, of strength and, and just, you know, the way he carries himself as a fighter. I, I learned a lot. And um, to me, that's priceless. And, and I loved Ben and, and I love his gym and I love Luis and I love Chicago. And I'm just excited to continue to evolve my game and to continue to grow as a fighter. I think it's very exciting. Wow. I think you've single-handedly sold us on potentially going down to Kenosha and training with the Big Ben. So does this mean that Juliana Pena will be going out in an in a next fight entering with a, a cloak? Is that correct? Yeah. You know, he kind of gave me that, like, Sith, Darth Vader feel, and, and I like it. You know what I mean? You, you got to have a theme a little bit, and I like his theme, and, and I appreciate it. He... Uh, kind of gave me a, a bit more of a swagger in my step, if you will, uh, by being being around him. I'm just curious. What about the evil laugh? Because we know he's got the best evil laugh in the business. Did he get? To, did you show him your evil laugh, and did he give you any pointers in that area? And I think anybody who's heard me laugh knows that I can cackle like a witch and just <laughs> laugh so loud. So, so uh, I, I think he, he didn't need to cue me up on any of the laughter or anything like that. I'm pretty sure I got that down. Yeah, we, we heard it uh, firsthand when you were here in Melbourne. All right, Juliana, we'll let you go. But before we do, I'm just wondering, do you have any messages to the fans, be it Australian or anywhere around the world? Obviously, you know, it's it's been a hard few months and the fans have pretty much gotten their chance to say anything and everything to you over social media. We, we imagine anything that you want to say to the fans. Uh, yes, you know, I, I thank you for bringing up the Australian fans. They were so warm and loving, and, and I appreciate that. I love Australia. Your country is beautiful, and I can't wait to go back there. Um, with that being said, my support in Venezuela, all my family in Venezuela, um, you know, my whole half half of my family all live there, you know, and they support me immensely. And that to me is, is, is priceless too. You know, you got a whole country that's behind you that supports you, and you represent that country. And to me, that is just such a... Um, a treat and, and a, a a gift, if you will. And so I'm so excited to be representing the country of Venezuela. And so hello to all of my Venezuelan fans. Um, the United States, you know, the people out there that doubt me, but still watch me, thank you. You know, if I'm the topic of your conversation, whether it be hate or love, thank you for blessing me to be the topic of conversations for you guys, you know. Um, I want people to watch my fights, and at the end of the day, that's the moral of the story. Get people to watch these fights. Um, so, so thank you to all of my diehard fans. Thank you to anybody who's ever supported me and watched me. Everyone in the United States that that you know loves me as a fighter. I, I feel the love from all over the globe, actually, and that's what's so crazy about this sport is it's a it's a worldwide global thing, and and so it's it's so nice to hear and your heart just feels so warm and i just want to say thank you thank you for that support and thank you for for believing in me the way that i believe in myself i it, it means the world to me honestly i can't even uh say that enough it really does mean the world to me all right guys well you can follow juliana on twitter at venezuelan vixen to keep track of her updates very excited to see your return and you get matched up with thanks again for chatting with us today juliana thank you guys i appreciate it thank you so much Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Demetrius Johnson, the USC flyweight champion of the world, and you're listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys. Our next guest is coming off a big win at UFC Brisbane. You know him as the Celtic kid. Jake Matthews, welcome to Submission Radio. How are you? Good, mate. How are you? Very good. It's great to finally have you on the show. We've obviously interviewed you live in person many times, but this is your first time on the show. Congratulations on the big victory. you got to ask, how good does it feel to have the fight behind you and be able to eat whatever you want again, specifically bread rolls? Yeah, it feels pretty good. and um, It's just just the, the caliber of fighter that Johnny Case um, is and getting a win over him and also to top it off, you know, fighting in Australia and getting a bonus. You know, it doesn't get any better than that. And, um, yeah, his, his, the celebrations have been good. Just been relaxing back in Melbourne. Uh, like you said, eating whatever I want. Been eating probably a bit too much. But um, we'll get back in the gym next week and start figuring out who we want next. 
We have to ask, what was the first thing you ate after, you know, finishing your cut, cutting your weight? Because we know you do a big weight cut. What was the first thing that you ate? Uh, the first thing I ate, actually, we went into the catered room we have for the fighters, and I actually wasn't that hungry. I was pretty tired, and I was still, you know, still pretty hot from um, from the fight. So, I think I, the first thing I grabbed was just a small bowl of ice cream, um, and then I didn't eat till later on. I just had some, uh, just some hot chips later on, and. Um, just a lot of ginger ale. And that <laughs> G- was it. Ginger ale. Is this the favourite beverage of choice for Jake Matthews? It is, yeah. Ginger ale or ginger beer. Um, either one, yeah. So I had a had a fair of that that night as well. And then the, the buffet breakfast the next morning. Very nice. We, we're going to ask you about the weight cut, though, because we heard that you had almost 20 pounds to cut just days before the weigh-ins. Is this true? And how hard was this particular weight cut for you? It was actually the easiest weight cut um, we've done. Uh, we just... We got it down to a science. Um, we try to get my, we try to get myself back in there as heavy as I can for the fight. So we don't want to. I know there's a new, there's sort of like a new phase going on where fighters drop down and only cut like two or three kilos uh, in water weight. Um, mm-hmm. But we, yeah, the last couple of days we just, I just really don't eat anything at all. Um, I water load and I lose two, three kilos just, just in those last couple of days alone. Um, still hydrated, and then we can start the weight cut. So I think all up probably cut about five or six um, kilograms in water, and I still felt good. I still felt reasonably hydrated after the after the water cut, and um, felt even better in the fight. That's the best I've ever felt in the fight, and the easiest weight cut's ever been. Because mm. for those who watched the Fox Sports documentary, The Celtic Kid. That was a really brutal weight cut for you. Or, I mean, I don't know if that's if that's how it usually is, but the way it showed it in that documentary, it seemed absolutely brutal. You know, Dad looked a little bit worried. Are you saying that no more of those kind of weight cuts and it was a lot easier than that one? Oh, 10 times easier. That was that, that one was a bit hard because the sauna was about a 10-minute drive away from the hotel, so, and the scales weren't right, so, we have to, so we're getting, like, you know, taxi ride to the sauna weighing in, going back to the hotel for the UFC scales and weighing yourself, and just back and forth. And it was just, just took a lot longer than usual and it was just a lot more energy going up and down the elevators. And, um, you know, it just, it just took a lot more energy out of you. So it was a bit harder in that sense. Um, whereas this, this this cut, you know, the scales were, were in the same hotel as the sauna. So it was easy. And, um, yeah, and it, they just get easier as we go. So I think I'll be, I'll be happy at lightweight for a while. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the questions that all the media sort of talks about every time your fight's coming up. Are you looking at a long future at 155, or do you sort of do see a time, because you are quite young at the moment, when you do get a bit older and you will have to move up a weight class? Uh, if you say that's to happen, then that, that'll happen. Uh, I did always want to be a welterweight, just because George St. Pierre is my favorite fighter. And um, I remember back when I was just started fighting pro, my first couple of pro fights, um, actually, all my fights outside the UFC were lightweight. I uh, were at welterweight, and I used to rock up to the weigh-ins about 75 kilos. Now try and drink as much of water as I can to see to, to make myself look heavier. <laughs> um, just because I wanted to be a welterweight, but at the moment, like I said, the weight cuts are getting easier. So uh, I don't see a time in the near future where I'll be moving up. But if a day does come where uh, I decide to move up or I have to move up, then then I'll do that, and it'll just it'll, it'll be almost like I'm starting over again. You know, you got it'll be a new sort of fighting style I'll have. Um, I have more strength, different opponents, um, so I'd actually be looking forward to it. Yeah, interesting. Now, speaking of welterweight, one of the biggest stories to come out of UFC Brisbane was the Hector Lombard versus Neil Magny fight, specifically how long it took the referee to stop the fight. Before we get your thoughts on the fight itself, I'm just wondering, did you get a chance to watch it live after your fight? Um, yeah, I was watching bits and pieces. You know, I was sitting on my phone and talking to other fighters, but I caught I caught bits and pieces of it, and um, I did I did catch the instance that you're talking about um, with the strikes on the ground. I mean, Carl Noak and Ben Ten were cage side and stood there with their jaws on the floor. What did you think when you saw the referee wasn't stopping the fight despite Hector not protecting himself at all? Yeah, I think definitely let it go way too long. It was a it was a bit of a joke actually. Um, the the punches weren't. You know, Magny was tired and the punches weren't doing too much damage. I think Hector was, you know, he was still able to come out the next round and fight. Um, so I guess I guess he was still there, he was still okay, but 
But even even so, the rule is if you're not defending yourself intelligently, regardless of how hard the punches are, they stop it. And um, it still would have done some damage. And uh, it's just it just doesn't it doesn't look good when you're watching someone take a hunting of 101 unanswered strikes to the head. Um, so it definitely should have been stopped. But you know, it, it, it's a hard job being a referee. So you, you never know what he was thinking. Or um, but I, I would have, if I was a ref, I would have stopped it for sure. Yeah, certainly. I mean, not the first time that Percival has had some controversy in the ring. Obviously, he does a lot of Aussie cards. If you found out he was your referee for your next fight, would you have any hesitation at all after seeing his performance at UFC Brisbane? No, not at all. I think I think the UFC would would um, have words with him and, and tell him, and maybe maybe get some more experienced referees in there to explain to him. And uh, I think he he would learn from it. You know. You, I don't think he'd want that to happen again because he may not refer another fight after that. Um, so yeah, but I'd be I'd be more than happy for him to ref. He's a good ref. I've seen him before ref the local shows. And I'm just curious. I'm not sure how close you are with Hector, but did you get a chance to see him or speak to him after the fight and uh, maybe get his thoughts? I saw him the morning after. Mm. Um, he was just he was out and about walking around. He was fine. Um, I didn't get a ch- chance to speak to him. Um, but he, he he looked like he was in high spirits. He's just he's a real nice guy, Hector. He's just he's got a smile on his face no matter what. Um, and and also with with the fight as well, if if Magni had of gone they had to go into that third round and Magni had of lost for whatever reason, um, that's when the controversy would start because um, you know the fight should have been stopped in that second round. So mm. if, if if that was me and my opponent ended up winning the fight. Then, then I'd be a bit spewing. Yeah, certainly. I mean, fortunately, no one looks like got injured really badly, but who knows until, you know, the scans and appropriate stuff happens with Hector and, and his brain. I'm just wondering, watching something like that, Jake, do you ever worry about the risk of brain damage and just to your general health when you see moments like that um, when watching the fights? Uh, no. Well, you sort of um, always have confidence in the referee that they're going to look after you. Um, I guess, you know, sometimes, like, for instance, on the weekend, um, they just have, like, a, a lapse in judgment or, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. You, you can't look at that and not think you have to stop the fight. But um, the, you, you sort of you sort of do have a fair bit of trust in the referee to, to stop it when it needs to be stopped, even though you probably wouldn't want them to. Um, but, but yeah. But, uh, no, I don't, I don't have any... I never go into a fight worrying about anything like that, like brain damage or, or getting hurt. Um, you know, you, it's a fight. You're going to get hit. It's just your job to to sort of minimise how many times you get hit. Um, but yeah, no, nah, I never really think about that stuff. Hmm. Well, fortunately, in your fight, you managed a beautiful choke in the third round against Johnny Case. It was a great statement. But did you feel you needed it to win the fight, or were you confident that you were you you were going to get that decision regardless? Going to that third round, did you think you were up on the scorecards? Yeah, uh, I watched the fight back and. I'm 100% certain that I the first and third rounds. Um, but even the, even though I thought we were one apiece, I still went into the fight thinking that he was he was winning the fight. And that's just how I do every every round. Um, you know, every every time there's a new round, I reset myself and I say, you know, it goes back to my old football days. Every time there's a new quarter or a new round, reset and you tell yourself the scores are even. The scores are zero zero, so the fight starts again. So you're gonna have to go out. And, you, to, uh, and in that way, I don't get comfortable or complacent if, if you're winning or you don't start panicking and rushing if you're losing. Um, and I just stay, stay calm and composed. And if you, look at, if you look at a fight round by round, I think, and you try and win each round and you get worried about, you know, did I win that round, did I not? That's when you start sort of panicking and rushing where I look at it as a whole 15 minutes. So I have 15 minutes to beat him. So I had 15 minutes to work my body shots and, and wear him down and wear him down. And, and I was confident all the way up to I got that choke that I was still going to finish the fight. Um, and I think I think that confidence and is sort of what, you know, I could, I could have just held on to his back and thought, if I just hold on here, I'll win the fight. Um, but I wanted to push for the finish and I liked getting finishes. And I think it was lucky that I did because even though I was sure that I was up on the scorecards, the judges had him um, winning the first two rounds. Mm-hmm. Well, we saw that you hung out with Johnny after the fight. Just wondering, what was that like? And how does a typical conversation go with your opponent, especially after all the trash talk he's been spitting your way after you beat them? 
Yeah, uh, you're the trash talk, you know. Um, you can't take that stuff personally because he doesn't know you personally. I know it's just he's trying to play the whole McGregor thing and um, hype the fights up, which is good. It um, you know, it makes people want to see the fight. And not only can he trash talk, but Johnny can he backs it up every single time. You know, he's a he's a beast and he's like the hardest guy I've ever fought. Um, and afterwards, when we straight after the fight, I think there's a there's video going around and of me and Johnny in the octagon. I'm having a chat, and then I saw him out the back in the change rooms, and we're chatting, and you know we we're just talking about the fight pretty much. Um, you know, he, he was saying he was talking about our body kicks, and and I was saying oh, I didn't know you were that good of a wrestler, and you know we were just talking about our training and and what we did to prepare, um, just just general stuff like that, and then we we went up at the pub afterwards, and just just chatting about you know just everything and anything. Um, he's actually yeah you know, he's, he's a really he's a really really nice guy. You guys are were at the pub, but is it true that you don't drink, Jake? No, I don't, I don't drink. I've um, I've drank alcohol twice in my life. Why is that? Uh, is is it, is it a recent sort of change to do with diet, or is it just uh, you know, since you were young, never drank alcohol, or, or other than those two times? Yeah, I, I turned eighteen and uh, drank a couple of times and just didn't like it. I'd I'd wake up on a on a Sunday morning and just felt like crap, and I couldn't go to training, so I just Stop drinking, just drank soft drink, and I'd still go out with my friends, and I'd go out the whole night, and then I'd go home Sunday morning, and I'd still be able to go and train train that day, and I just preferred it that way. Um, and not only that, I just don't I don't really go out to clubs or never really been into that scene, so that's why I never got to, into drinking, and um, I think soft drink tastes better anyway, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, well, soft drink is the bomb. I mean, we we love a bit of soft drink. Ask Casper about his Coca Cola habits, and he'll tell you some interesting stories. But let me ask you something, Jake. I mean, a lot of young people do enjoy going out, clubbing, drinking, partying. You're obviously a, a bit of a celebrity down here. A lot of people know who you are. What do you do to sort of relax and chill out apart from training? I know that you obviously go to university and also teach classes. But what do you do to chill out? What 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 do you sort of do with your buddies to sort of let the steam off? Um, yeah, I've got I've got a, a smallish group of friends. They all train at the gym with me, and we just we'll get the the mountain bikes, go do some downhill mountain biking, take the motorbikes out. A few of them have properties, so um, we'll go up the edge for the weekend. We've got kayaks. We go abseiling and rock climbing. Um, got all our own equipment. We have uh, you now we go into the rifle range and, and shoot targets. So anything outdoors that we can do is pretty much what we'll go and do every time we've got a free day or a free weekend. Um, and that's and then yeah, pretty much all group of friends are the same. We don't we don't go out anywhere. Um, we'll go to a pub once in a blue moon to watch some fights. Uh, apart from that, we're never really indoors. Yeah, sounds like a good time hanging out with Jake Matthews. I'm wondering, you seem pretty happy with being slotted into these Australian cards, Jake, but. Does a part of you want to fight on some big international cards so that you can expose yourself to other markets? Because from what we've heard, a lot of the Aussies are in a similar position where they've been pigeonholed in, into these local cards and they want to get you know exposure overseas. Um, no, I mean, it would be good. Of course, it would be good to go and fight uh, international and not so much for promotion or anything, but I, just, I think one of the perks of fighting in the UFC is you get to travel and fight in different countries and different cities um so in that sense it'd be good go and experience our like, different cultures and things but uh, as long as i can fight in australia i'm happy um fight cam's easy all my friends and family can come up and support me i don't have to worry about jet lag and get to the hotel as late as i want in the week um and then everything's just more comfortable or just wherever i felt fight in australia regardless of if it's brisbane sydney melbourne i just feel like i'm at home um so it makes everything a lot easier. But in saying that, there's going to come a time where I'm going to fight internationally. So it would be good to start getting that experience of, you know, the jet lag, the long flight, not having to be at the hotel for longer, um, not being the, the crowd favourite, uh, you know, all, all that. So um, it'll be uh, yeah, be interesting to see. And I think I think my next fight may be, may will be because uh, I think there's only one more Australian card this year at the end of the year. And I definitely want to fight before then, so I think the next one will be an international fight somewhere.
Mm-hmm. And that will be interesting to see. Now, you're only 21 years old and you've yet to come close to hitting your prime. But as a young fighter, how long do you see yourself competing in MMA? And do you think you'll still be fighting when you're around your mid-30s? Because obviously you started at such a young age. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm happy training. I love my life, you know. I just train every day. I see my friends every day, train my friends. Go all the time in the world to go and, and, and do what I want. Um, I'm running my gym, which I love doing. Uh, I love fighting. So as long as I can do this, I'm happy. And I just, I'll just fight as long as my body lets me, I guess. And, um, you know, I think I'm probably going to hit my peak around... 30s, they say normally. So I've still got nine years until I hit my peak. So um, mm. I think I think you got everyone seeing me fighting for a while yet. That is a scary thought that you're already a five fight uh, UFC veteran and you've got nine years before potentially before we see you peak. That's crazy. But the reason why we ask is because you already own your own gym, like you mentioned. You're also studying at uni. Once you graduate, do you see yourself following your academic career instead of fighting at, at any point? Or do you think you'll do both of them? Sort of, I guess people throw around the term part-time fighter. I don't think anyone will call you a part-time fighter. But w- what would you do with that you know, academic career and, and your degree from uni? Yeah, it's... You know, I could, I could apply it to my training because um, it's, it's a, you know, it's to do with sports, and um, you know, it dabbles in like sports medicine and things like that, um, and exercise science. So I could apply it to my own training. I can go and I could go and become a PE teacher, which I don't think I could. I, I don't know how happy I'd be with that going from fighting in the UFC to being a teacher. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you, know, you, all, you never know what can happen in this sport, so that's why. Yeah, certainly you'll be. Able- credentials afterwards it's not so much that i want to be a teacher it's just that it's, it's a fallback and and i um, hope the day never comes that i'll have to you know give up fighting um due to an injury but um you, you never know so it's just a smart way to do it i think yeah i mean jake matthews becoming a pe teacher has a cheesy 80s movie written all over it i mean mm. i could see arnold schwarzenegger coming yeah. in and playing jake matthews <laughs> put your toy and sit down now let's talk about fighting let's talk about what's next for jake matthews it's been a week since your victory of a journey case have you had a chance to think about who you'd like to face next uh no nah, i've got a um i've got a ban on fighting this week so mm-hmm. dad said to me you're not to even think about fighting you know just not to go to the gym not to do anything so come next week you know but getting back into training slowly and, and we'll start trying to figure out who I want to fight, talk to my management, who they think they can get me, um, maybe even where we want to fight. Um, but this week, it's when, when I get a fight, that's, that's all that's on my mind. So leading up to Johnny Case, I haven't even haven't even thought once about who I'd want next or where I want to fight next. Um, now it's all done. Now we can start focusing on that. So, but um, I don't know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of big cards coming up, a lot of... You know, a lot, of, a lot of fights in Vegas, and you've got the one in Madison Square Garden now. That's coming up pretty soon. So, I don't know. We'll, we'll have a look and talk to my management and see where they can get me, and, and as soon as we know, everyone else will know. Yeah, I, I feel like this interview is very contradictory to your whole ban on fighting. I'm not uh, I'm not sure if, you're, if your dad <laughs> okay. is even aware that you're Sorry, doing this, this interview. Yeah, well, Submission Raider is just killing this whole no no fighting week. But i got to ask you, your name has been tied to Sage Northcutt for a while now because... You know, you're both extremely young, talented, and not too long ago, you were both undefeated. There's been a lot of mixed reports, though, about whether this is a fight that you're interested in, because you've always said that you'd fight anybody, and I feel like people want to throw your name in there with Sage. Is is he, is he Sage Northcutt actually somebody that's on your radar and you actively want to pursue a fight with, or would it just be another fight for you? Yeah, if the UFC sends me an email and says, Sage Northcutt, this date, um, then, you know, then I'll fight him on that day. But I'd prefer someone who's higher ranked. Um, if Stage was still undefeated, then I'd be I'd be asking for that fight. Um, but now the fact that he's been beaten by you know a relative no one, um, it's not the fight that it could have been. And I think all I've got to gain from a fight with Stage is you know a couple of thousand social media followers. Um, whereas if he had won his last fight, then everyone'd be saying you know. He's a beast, he's this, he's that, but now everyone's saying the hype train's over, he's not as good as everyone thought, so I don't see the point in fighting him. I want to fight people that you know, are going to push me um, and that people would think, like, you know, fans would think he's a good fight. So 
we're gonna have a, yeah, like I said, we're gonna have a look at the rankings and see, you know, just pick someone who's like maybe ten spots above me, and you know, just slowly creep up as we've been doing. And um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think, you know, like I said, they ask me on fight stage, but it's not something that I'm chasing. Yeah, it's interesting that you mention that. I mean, just quickly, you mentioned how he lost and didn't look very good in his last performance. If you guys did sort of get put up against each other, would you see it as a competitive fight? How would you see yourself matching up with him? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it would be. I think he's just he just sort of bullied his first couple of opponents. Um, and, yeah, I think, I think I'd be too much for him. I'm, I'm, I'm a fair bit bigger than him with all his muscles and that. I'll still be stronger than him. Like I just I beat Johnny Case, you know, he hasn't lost since 2011, 12 fight winning streak. I can't, yeah, so I can't see Sage being much. He's still, he's in the UFC. Like, there's never a hard fight in the UFC, and anything can happen on any given day, but I think I'd have it over him. Uh, Jake, we really appreciate the time you're giving us, and we'll let you go very shortly. Um, just a couple more things that we want to touch on before we let you go. You say you want to fight opponents ranked higher than you. You were also not too long ago briefly campaigning for a fight against Conor McGregor when RDA withdrew from UFC 196. What made you want to put up your hand and, and face McGregor? Um, I think every fighter should have. It's uh, an opportunity to fight McGregor, whether, whether people think you're going to win or not, or whether even you think you're going to win or not. Um, you know, you, you never like. I, I, I didn't even think there was a one percent chance that the UFC would contact us and say, "All right, you can fight McGregor." But you never know. If, if they did have, I would have taken that fight a hundred percent. And just for the, just for what it is, the promotion, and you know, everyone would know your name after that. So I think, um, like I said, didn't think we would get a call up, but there's no no harm in trying. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it was an interesting performance from McGregor, who lost to Nate Diaz at welterweight. If you did get that fight with him, how would you have seen that fight going if you got the call? Pick myself and McGregor. Um, I think, I think in the wrestle and and on the ground, I, I think that'd be too much for him. I've seen his he's sort of just against Nate Diaz. I uh, guarantee Nate Diaz wouldn't choke me out like that uh, and handle me on the ground like that. I just, you know, we've, we've said it to our friends a lot, a lot. You know, McGregor, he's a good fighter and he's just, he's a you know, awesome stand-up fighter. I don't think he's a complete mixed martial artist. Um, he just he just beats people before they get in there. He makes them that angry that they just want to stand up and brawl with him. Whereas what they should be doing is trying to take him to the ground because his ground game isn't really there. So that's yeah, that would be the game plan. Whether whether I could do it or not is a different story. But that's what we do. We try and you know get him to the ground. You don't want to stand up with him. He's, he's a monster on the feet. Mm-hmm. Um, but who knows? Maybe maybe you down the track on trying get that match up with him. Um, I think I think it's together that's pretty awesome for sure now jay before we let you go we're going to do something fun that we do with most of our guests called the smish rated tap out round uh should take no more than a minute or two and then we'll let you go basically we'll ask you a bunch of fun quick questions and you answer them with the first thing that comes to mind kind of like word association are you ready yep all right batman versus superman is out and now we'll actually be reviewing it later on the show but we hear that you're not much of a batman guy and you're picking superman why is that jake uh yeah, I'm not much of a Batman fan. I don't think there's too much special about him. Um, I actually went and watched that movie last night, and it was it was pretty awesome. Oh, wow. You're giving it a good review. Well, we'll see if it matches up to our one. Now, Robert Whittaker and Beck Rollins both made it into the EA UFC game, but unfortunately, no Jake Matthews. How bummed out are you that you're missing out on the action, man? Uh, honestly, I don't really, I don't really care. Um, I didn't get into I didn't get into fighting to be on a video game. Um, and you know, to see some of the other people that are on the game sort of just makes me think, oh, I don't really care. If they're, you know, they're on it, it mustn't be too much, mustn't be too special to get on the game. But um, it would be awesome to be in a video game. There's not many people in the world that can say they're on a video game. But, um, but yeah, that's not almost sort of the last thing I'm thinking of when it comes to fighting. Um, I'm just curious, did you at least get the full body scan that EA sort of did with everyone? Were you part of that? Oh, yeah, I've done all that. Yeah, yeah they're taking the, the photos and the scan of my body. So they've got me on record if, if the day comes that they do put me in. But, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't get into fighting for, you know, to be in a video game. Well, there you go. Jake Matthews might be a DLC in the future. Uh, you can have only one type of celebratory bread roll, Jake. Which one do you choose? Uh, farmhouse sourdough. Mm-hmm. Farmhouse sourdough, okay, yeah. If you could have a yeah. beer at the pub with any celebrity in the world, who would you choose and why? Mark Wahlberg. Um, just because he's my favourite actor, and um, 
just like love every single one of his movies. So he, and he and he just seems like an interesting guy as well. Yeah, apparently, apparently a massive gambler. Be honest here, Jake. When approaching girls in the club, how many times have you opened up by saying, "Hi, I'm I'm UFC fighter Jake Matthews." That's right, the Jake Matthews. Not once. <laughs> no, no doubt yeah, you will yeah, after this like, interview, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would just be like, "What's UFC?" And you have to explain it to them, and it's just, it's just a it's just a drain. I say you just don't even bother. Yeah, that's yeah, true. yeah, yeah. You, you must be going out of Melbourne quite frequently now. Settle a debate for us, Jake. Mighty Ducks one, two, or three. Which one is the best and why? Uh, I've only ever seen Mighty Ducks one, so I'm going to say Mighty Ducks one. You're probably Dennis. I'm just curious. What do you think? Mighty Ducks one, two, or three? You're well, the- I think Jake is close. Three is definitely the worst one. But Jake, on that topic, when you fight, do you ever wish you had Coach Bombay in your corner telling you to do a triple dick? Yeah, he was doing the um, what's it called? The- the Flying Triangle or something like that. Oh, yeah, Flying V. Um, you, Richie yeah. Walsh, and Dan Kelly. Flying V, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, we could do that, yeah. With our team of May ever. And, Jake, you and your dad seem to have a pretty fun relationship. What's one thing that you can beat him at most of the time? Uh, There's got to be something. I can't think of anything. Nah, there's nothing. Wow. He never lets him win at anything. Wow. No, I'm, yeah. I'm being honest. I can't think of a thing that I can beat that in. PR, Jake, on the phone to Submission Radio. Finally, Jake... Give us your prediction, of course. Who's going to win in the AFL Grand Final in 2016? What are the two teams that are going to make the cut? And who's going to win the wooden spoon this season? I like to, I'm going to say Hawthorne because um, that's who I go for. Hawks versus... I don't really know who else is doing well. Conor McGregor. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably win that. I don't know. I can't really see four feet coming. Um, I'm going to say... Lions will have the wooden spoon, and I think it'll be Hawks versus. I don't know, mate. I got a feeling maybe the Roos will do all right this year. Yeah, yeah, the Kangaroos yeah. might come out of nowhere. More realistically, it'll probably be Hawthorne versus Conor McGregor in in a stunning 2016 AFL Grand Final. Jake, thank you so much for your time, guys. Don't forget to follow on Jake on Twitter at Jake Matthews UFC. Tons of great updates, and uh, we can't wait to see who you get matched up with next. Again, thank you so much for taking the time and chatting with us today, Jake. Thanks, guys. What's up, fight fans? I'm the reason mixed martial arts is banned in New York, Tommy Toehold. And you're listening to Submission Radio. Let's do this shit! Our next guest was a part of a major upset in the UFC 196 main event. The boxing coach, Tanae Diaz. Richard Perez, welcome back to Submission Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming back on the show, Richard. We obviously spoke to you before the fight. Here we are now that Nate Diaz, a few weeks now since he's defeated Conor McGregor. I'm just wondering, that big win, what did it do for the boxing gym? What has it done for Richard Perez boxing? I mean, it's done good. You know, it's, I've got people coming in still and, call, you know, people coming down from, uh, like a guy coming down from Oregon to come and take a picture with me and congratulate me and Nick, Nathan, but Nathan wasn't here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it was a huge, huge moment. I'm just wondering, Richard, how does one celebrate such a big, big moment in his coaching career? I mean, you coached, you effectively coached Nate Diaz to a massive, massive upset in the MMA world. Uh, they had a party for him in Stockton, you know, uh, his hometown over there, and uh, it was nice. It was really good. Uh, they gave him a plaque, and, and they awarded him something, you know, and they told him what a great job, you know, and it was, it was good. There you go. Richard Perez getting down with the Diaz brothers. So, of course, we have to talk about that first fight before we look forward. So one of the biggest questions is, when we spoke to you originally, you said that Nate Diaz was in good shape. Of course, one would say that going into a fight. Can you tell us, honestly, what kind of shape was Nate Diaz really in? Because it came out that he was potentially in Cabo, on a boat, sort of enjoying his time off. What kind of shape was Nate Diaz really in? Well, he wasn't really in tip-top shape, but I mean, uh, he, you know, because he, was, he, he wasn't expecting a fight. But he was still training here and there, and not as much, you know. And then when uh, when they told us that he had a fight, he was in Cabo. He called me, and I said, "Okay." He said, "I'll be back, and we'll start training." The next day, he was here, and we just did it. I mean, he was in tip-top shape. That's why, uh, you know, people take two-week notice. Nine times out of ten, they're going to win the fight, especially when they're fighting somebody that's, you know, t- on top of the world, you know. Mm. And uh, but I, I had I really had good doubts that he was going to win this fight, and so did he. You, you, sorry, you, you did have doubts or you didn't have doubts? No, I, I knew he was going to win it. Just so did he because we were training. We were training really good. You know, he had sparring, not a whole bunch of sparring. I probably had like three days of sparring. 
you know, and then he worked on mitts with me, and he, you know, he did other stuff, but, um, you know, he, when he puts his mind to it, he does it, just like I do when I train people. When I put my mind to it, I do it. There's no excuses at all. We just get in there and do it. Obviously, Conor McGregor was coming in with a lot of confidence, and essentially the world bet against Nate Diaz. At what point did you feel the confidence that you say you knew Nate Diaz was going to win at what point did you feel that was it before he called or was it was it when he called you and said he had the fight was it immediate or was it once he sort of came in the gym and you started seeing what kind of shape he was in and started working out yeah. at, at what point did you feel you know he's got this about well, I say the fourth day you know fourth day of the, of the training you know I, I could see it and feel it when he worked on the mitts and uh, I sparred when he sparred the, the second time he went, he went like eight rounds of sparring. Yeah, no, certainly. It was an interesting situation. I mean, we have to talk about the build-up to the fight. The press conference stare-down saw a hand punch from Conor McGregor. And in a lot of ways, me and Casper sort of thought back to the Ronda Rousey Holly Home way in at UFC 193 in Melbourne where Rousey sort of bum-rushed home on stage. When you saw Conor McGregor hand-punched uh, Nate Diaz, what kind of sign did that show you? Like, what kind of, what kind of message did it send to you? No, that that's nothing. That doesn't mean anything. You know, it's when you get in the cage. You know, you can talk. You can you can you can talk all that talk. You can you can throw throw you know a punch at his hand. That doesn't scare Nathan, and that doesn't bother me at all. That's just something that he's just doing just for uh, media or for the people out there to show that he ain't scared. You know, but that doesn't make any difference. I mean, he did that, and that just made it worse for him because Nathan, you know, he doesn't take any crap from anybody. Sure. I mean, that's that's what we've seen from Nate over the years. A lot of people look at that punch and they say probably one of two things. Either Conor McGregor did it because he's trying to sell more tickets or he was doing it because maybe he was... Maybe Nate was in his head. Do you think there was any of that? Do you no. think Nate got in his head? No, he, he didn't get in his head? <laughs> no. Nobody can get... Nobody, I haven't seen anybody get Nate to his head yet. He, he, he loves that kind of stuff, you know? He uh, whether they're 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 trying to play games with him or not, even if they're not, he doesn't he doesn't care. He's out there to fight. He has his, his mind made up, and that's what he does. He goes out there and does it, no matter if the guy is really nice to him, or being a jerk and talking smack. It doesn't make any difference because it's what Nathan wants, to, what what he has in his mind, and what's he going to do, and that's what makes him work. Do you think that Nate Diaz got into Connor's head before that fight at all? Oh yeah. Heck yeah! When he told me he was on steroids, I mean, he got blew up. He blew up on that. If it would have been me, I would have been laughing. Nathan, if I was fighting Nathan, he said, "Hey, you're on steroids, Richard." I said, "And I'm not on steroids." I would have laughed about it and said, "Hey, give me some more." But when somebody is 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 guilty about something, they stand up and they get a defense. They get a defense zone on there, and they you know they try to, oh, I'm not on it. You know, blah, blah, blah. you know that's that's my point of view. I don't know about anybody else. That's my point of view. I'm I'm just curious because before the uh, before the fight, we did an interview where you mentioned, hey, there might be a good chance that McGregor is on steroids because of his reaction and because of the way he looks. After the fight has been said and done, do you still question the fact whether or not he was on steroids? Well, I'm not, I mean, I'm I don't I don't I'm not around him. Like I told you at the beginning, I said uh, I'm I'm not the one that really knows, but I, just by watching a guy come up from 145 to 170, you. You're gonna have some fat on you. Believe me, you can have some fat somewhere, around your waist somewhere. He didn't have any fat at all. He was solid muscle. So, how are you gonna build that much in, in two weeks and be solid muscle? You know right. what I'm saying? Because he was so, supposed to fight at 155, but he was already overweight. I know he was. So when he found out that uh, what's the name uh, hurt his ankle, I don't know if he broke it. Then, you know, he said he he called Nathan out at 170. So that tells me right there that he couldn't get down the weight because something's making him build up. But what I'm wondering, Richard, is now that the fight has been said and done, do you still have the same thoughts on it, or have, you, have your thoughts changed a little bit after seeing his performance? Well, you know, he, I'm, I'm not, like I say, I'm not the one that really knows about him, but mm. to me, I feel like he's got to be on some kind of some kind of substance, you know, to get built up. Because he's a little guy, you know? And a little guy can't get real bulky that quick. I mean, he's gonna, if they fight, they're going to have like three months. That's fine. Nathan's going to have plenty of time to in, in camp to get in good shape. So McGregor's never seen Nathan in really good shape. He's seen him only half-ass. This is nothing. He, was, he wasn't in really in tip-top shape at all, you know. And I knew, we knew that the first round was going to be real quick for McGregor. So Nathan and I, you know, we worked on it and said, he, you know, we talked about him going out there and not get carried away, you know, don't get in a slugfest, move around. You know, he got hit a couple times, you know, but 
it was no big deal. He came, he came back second round, and he went out there and started letting, letting them hands go, and that's what started the whole, turned the whole thing around. Once he got hit in the face, it was over with, because then he couldn't take the punishment anymore. Just like McGregor said, I went to the ground, you know, I couldn't take the punches, and when he went to the ground, that was a bigger mistake, you mm. know, because Nathan's great standing up and great on the ground. Well, you've, you've covered a fair few topics there, Richard, and we'll, we'll sort of go back to that a little bit later on. I'm just wondering, uh, I guess, evaluate Nate's performance for us. Were you happy with it? I, obviously, you're happy with the outcome, but were you happy with it? Because in that first round, Nate did get hit with a lot of big punches. Yeah, but they didn't really hurt him because if you notice, he was going with the punch. Mm. And his right eye was already cut from the first, uh, when he fought uh, Michael Johnson, so it wasn't, I don't think it was really completely healed. And uh, it just opened up again, you know. I mean, he was going with the punches. He didn't really get hurt at all. Even with the uppercut, I could see his head coming up. He went with it. And the body shot, it wasn't it, – it, it, uh, the way McGregor threw it, it wasn't, it wasn't really uh, effective. So – because Nathan was doing a really good job. Sure, he was getting hit, but not like he should have got hit. Now, in a better shape, it's going to be a lot harder for McGregor, a lot harder. Mm. I'm just wondering, because a lot of people sort of looked at that fight as a very dominant round for McGregor. Was a part of you all surprised or nervous when you saw how dominant he was and how he was able to close the distance and land that many punches? Well, you know, he's a good fighter, but don't get me wrong. He's a great fighter, so we knew he was going to come out and, and, and we knew he was going to throw, you know, because he's quick. He's, he's pretty sharp. You know, that's why he's up there, and that's why Nathan's up there, but they never give him credit, you know, so until Nathan, you know, put this guy in his place, and now... Now Nathan, you know, now they're looking at him, but you know they should they should have done that a long time ago with Nathan because Nathan he fights anybody. He you know he's not he don't back down from anybody. And he he always gives gives a good show. He always gives a good show. You know he's not flaky. He don't give up. You know when McGregor, McGregor went to the ground, he was on his back. Nathan was hitting him. He turned on his belly because he gave up. When a guy turns on his belly like that, it's over. He's he's quitting in MMA. That's that I've seen that lots of times, and he just gave it up. A lot of people are sort of criticizing McGregor for not sort of going out in that situation. Um, he got obviously got put in a rear choke and he tapped straight away. Do you think that sort of takes anything away from the fight? Because a lot of people are very critical about the fact that McGregor tapped and didn't actually go out. Well, Gary, come out. He's always like that. When you watch all his fights, he starts off pretty fast. He always goes at people right away. That's, that's where he fights. You know, because I watched three or four of his fights already in those two weeks. So uh, we knew he was going to do that. So that's just the way he is. But if you watch the fight, the first round, yeah, everybody said McGregor took over, but Nathan was throwing the good shots. He threw the front kick to the body. He threw the jab to the body. He was hitting that body. He was, he was hitting that body. And, that, and people are saying that McGregor got tired of throwing the punches. That's not it. Those punches that Nathan was throwing, and they, 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 don't, they don't notice that, but he was working that guy, even though it wasn't a whole lot, but it meant, the punches meant really good when he hit him. It really counted. <clears throat> so I guess a lot of people, including ourselves, would have looked at the fight and sort of thought the McGregor gas, but you're saying it was Nate Diaz's punches that sort of slowed him down. I guess most people watching that fight were surprised when he did look a lot tired in the second round. Did you expect that to happen? Or was that something you were counting on, that this would be one of the first fights where McGregor would not really look his usual self in the second round and Diaz would, you know, certainly be the deciding factor well, behind that? <coughs> You know, I've seen him fight <clears throat> McGregor, and he does get a little tired in the later rounds, but not in the second round. You know, he really slows down, but the other guy slows down too. But it, when I see Nathan throwing the front kick to the body, you know, pick, picking his shots. He wasn't throwing a whole lot, but he was picking his shots. If you notice, he was working that body. Nobody was seeing it. He was, they were just seeing him. McGregor, oh, McGregor's throwing punches, throwing the kick. And then, you know, but a lot of them didn't really land that good. Sure, he threw a lot. He was trying to land. He threw some, landed quite a bit of punches, but Nathan's were more... Punisher. They were most more. Um, uh, they 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 counted more than his. If you look if you look at the fight the first round again, I watched the first round when I was there. I was it was live and I seen it. And when I noticed Nathan was throwing the front kicks and throwing the jab to the body, you know, and going and working him, not hard, but just enough to make those punches count. And then McGregor coming at him at the same time too, he got he got tired. And then when Nathan caught him with a left hand, it was over. 
I'm just wondering, Richard, what exactly was the game plan for that fight? Was the game plan to go out there and sort of wear Conor McGregor down slowly? And did you expect the fight to be over in the second round? Because I think a lot of people thought if Nate was going to win, he'd do it over five rounds, possibly in decision. Did you think it was going to fight? It was going to finish so early? Well, I figured Nathan, Nathan would beat him in the later rounds. You know, uh, either finish him or, or, beat him, or win him uh, by decision, or get him on the ground. I was thinking he'd get him on the ground and tap him out. You know, before he even threw any punches, I thought he, maybe he might get a chance to shoot on him because McGregor's easier to take down. If you watch other fights, he, he gets taken down all the time. But those guys don't know how to finish that when they're on the ground. You know, see, Nathan's the type of guy who will beat you standing up. Either he's going to make you go to the ground, or he'll take you to the ground. And, and that's the way Nathan fights. You can't mm. stop that. It was obvious that McGregor also gassed because of all the weight that he put on, all the muscle. I mean, it's a huge jump from featherweight all the way to welterweight. I mean, in hindsight, <laughs> do you think McGregor going up to 170 was more of a detriment to him rather than Nate? Well, he felt good. He felt good in that weight. That's why he took it because he knew he felt strong. And he was working hard, believe me. I seen his, his uh, uh, in the Facebook, I seen his workout techniques and stuff. He was doing good. I mean, his, you know, he was. He was in like in tip-top shape, you know. I, I mean, I watched him work. You know, they had highlights on him, and I said, okay, all right, you know. But we have our own thing too, so it's not just about him, you know. Everybody's just saying about, all about him, but it's not, you know. Nathan's a better fighter than him, a lot better fighter than him, you know. I mean, not because he's my fighter, it's because the way he trains and the way I train him. I'm, I'm very <laughs> curious. You mentioned that you were watching some of his training on on the internet. Did you happen to? have a chance to look at some of the movement training that he was doing. And what do you think about movement training that he was doing into coming into the fight? Well, that's the way he trains. You know, everybody has their own, their own ways of training. And I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, criticize it because I don't know anything about it. I don't do it. You know, I have my, my way of training and they have their ways and if they feel it's going to work, then they can, they can, they can do it, you know, but once they get in the ring, I mean, in the cage, it's a whole different story because, uh, I, we we train to fight, you know, and, and those things that they do, I don't know. I, I can't question that. I've seen Nate Diaz in the past say that he's had a movement coach uh, a long time, you know, before Conor McGregor, saying that he's obviously watched uh, the Hicks and Gracie documentary, Choke, and he got the inspiration there to get a movement coach or something similar. I'm not sure how sort of familiar you are with it, but if, if you are, can you tell us sort of about Nate Diaz's movement training, if, if he has anything resembling a movement coach? Movement training? Yeah, I, I have seen Nate Diaz say that he, he's been doing something similar. Like, I don't know if he has a, a Oh, yeah, yeah, coach. he does, but I wasn't going to say anything to you, but you brought it up. Yeah, he does. Can, well, can, can you talk to us about that? Well, I, I mean, not, uh, that's for him to tell you, not that, that because I don't, I don't do that. Certainly, but do you, I, I guess the question uh, the cast is trying to ask is, do you feel like it helps? Obviously, there's a lot of movement when you train Nate in the boxing, slips, head movement, footwork. Do you feel like a lot of Nate's movement is you know, quite good and also some of that movement training sort of plays into your training with him in terms of boxing? Sure. Okay, great. Well, I mean, let's move on and talk about what's next. A lot of people are sort of questioning what's going to be happening for Nate Diaz next. I'm just curious, Richard, there's a lot of fights being thrown out there. What kind of fight would you like to see for Diaz next? There's possible talks of a rematch with Conor McGregor, and also other people would like to possibly see him rematch. Rafael Dos Anjos, obviously, for the title. Who would you like to see Nate Diaz fight next? Well, whatever pays more money, you know, because we're tired of getting chump change. You know, and he's been a good fighter. He's been up there on top. He's fought everybody. And don't get me wrong, but Dana White doesn't, you know, doesn't put out for the money. I mean, and everybody likes, loves watching the Diaz brothers, and they love watching Nathan. So, you know, it's about time that, you know, just like McGregor and everybody else, you know, they want to get paid. You know, he just don't want to fight anybody. Now that he's, he, now that he's beat the best, let's, let's, pay him, let's pay him good, you know. Let's give him good fights and give him good money. Let's just quickly talk about this Rafael Dos Anjos fight before we move on to the more likely McGregor rematch. A lot of people are right. saying they don't want to see Nate Diaz do the rematch with RDA because he lost to him pretty, pretty recently in people's minds. If he did get a rematch with Rafael, how would you see the rematch going differently to the first time they fought? It would be a lot different because he was hurt in that fight. In a training camp, he got hurt. He don't tell nobody. But he was hurt in that train, the training camp, and he couldn't train for a while. I mean, for, for you know, for a while. I mean, most of the camp. I mean, he was pretty hurt. So, 
that's why I went Dos Santos' way, because Nathan couldn't perform as good as he usually does. And if you watch the fight, you can tell he he wasn't he wasn't in on it. Even people ask me, "Hey, that wasn't Nathan." I said, "I know." So what happened? I told him well, he got hurt in the camp. Why didn't he say? He don't say nothing. You know, fighters don't do that. You know, they just go out there and do it. And if they lose, they lose. They try to come back. I'm just curious. Uh, how serious was his injury? I mean, we have heard rumblings about the fact that he was hurt going into that one. But were you close to suggesting for him not to take the fight because the injury was so substantial on his performance? Yeah, I did tell him that. He said, no, I can't I can't back out. I said, you're right, but I just thought I'd ask you, you know. He said, I can't back out, Rich. You know, this, this is a world title fight, and I have to do it, you know. I said, okay, what, all right. What do you think about that mentality? Because at the time, it wasn't for a title. It was essentially just another fight. Nate Diaz hadn't been in the octagon for a while. What do you think about the mentality of taking a fight injured? Because obviously, it didn't go Nate's way. Now, here people are talking about how they may not want to see that rematch. Oh, it'd be a good one. Believe me. If it was a rematch, it'd be a good one because Nathan was hurt. People don't know that. They only see what they see, which is fine. You know, and Nathan don't want to say nothing. But I'm telling you, he was hurt. So that's why it went that way. Because Nathan, people know how Nathan fights. And he don't fight like that. He just went the distance and he, he slapped Dos Santos like four or five times when he was on his back. He even told Dos Santos when he slapped him, you can't, you can't take me out, I'm hurt. You know, I'm injured. And Dos Santos couldn't do anything about it. Well, yeah, we saw so the that, that, huh? that tells me a lot. I was just going to say, we saw the Stockton slap in that fight, but I'm just thinking, in hindsight, do you, do you regret Nate Diaz taking that fight? Do you think it would have been better for him to just, I guess, avoid that fight if he was that seriously no. injured? No, he, he, I think he did the right thing. You know, he's, he's, he's got to make the choices, and I have to go right with him. You have to follow with him and, and agree with him, because I can't, I'm not going to say he, you know, he shouldn't have done it, because it's over and done with, you know, and we're moving on. Now look where he's at. Mm. Sometimes it happens, you know. You get injured. He's been injured a couple of the fights too, you know. Like when he, I mean, he he fought uh, uh, Benson Henderson. He was hurt in that fight too. He couldn't really do very much, you know. Uh, Ross Thompson. That's another one, you know. He people don't see that, but I do because I train him. I, I'm with him. So, but he's he's a tough boy. He he don't quit. I'm just curious. Do you feel like if Nate Diaz is healthy? And you mentioned some of the losses that he had against Thompson and Henderson and obviously Adia. Do you feel like if Nate Diaz is healthy, he's able to beat anybody in the division? Yes. Watch his fights. When he, when he, does, when he performs real good, he has no problem in the camp. You can see that. It, it, it's, it's written all over him. You know, that's why he took some time off, you know, because he was, he was worried, fighting too much. So he, he decided to take some time off, and he came out real good now. He beat, he beat uh, Mike Johnson, who was supposed to be a good boxer. Oh, they talked really good. He was, he was, Nathan was an underdog. He about boxed him. And then here comes uh, McGregor. You know, uh, he's a golden boy. Uh, blah, 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 all the top, top, he's, you know, the top of the line. And, and I'm going, hey, what about Nathan? You know, but they don't, you know, they just see his bad performance when he's hurt, but they don't know that. And when he, when he does good, he performs good. Like uh, uh, all those other fights that he's, he's fought. Like that one time he fought 170. Uh, he stopped the guy in the first round. Uh, 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 Maynard, uh, not, what's the Maynard? He 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 stopped Maynard. Uh, there's a lot of guys. I mean, he's in, when he's in good health, he performs really good. You'll see it. You can tell when he doesn't perform good. Then you then you need to look at him and say there's something wrong with Nathan. It's not Nathan. Well, it seems like Nate Diaz sort of has his pick of really the lightweight division in a sense, and uh, you know he's he's making a big comeback when a lot of people wrote him off. But you mentioned welterweight before. What do you think about the possibility of Nate Diaz fighting Robbie Lawler for the belt? Because that was another fight that was talked about not too long ago, that maybe at UFC 200, Nate Diaz would fight Robbie Lawler. <laughs> Seems like a big money matchup. What do you think about that? Well, you know why they're talking about it, because he beat McGregor. Mm. Nathan's not a 170 fighter. He's a 155. But the one time he took a 170, I think he did it a couple of times. You know, because the manager he had, I guess, had him do it. I don't remember. I don't really remember what happened, but he took it. And uh, but he's a 155. He likes fighting at 155. But now that he beat McGregor, and and then they want Robbie Lawler. Robbie Lawler should go after Nick because Nick's one and knocked him out in the second round. That mm -hmm. should be a rematch. That had, that had, that shouldn't be had anything to do with Nathan. It's like Nathan going for uh, Dos Santos. You know that you know somebody's bringing this up about uh, Robbie Lawler. Because Nathan beat 
McGregor at 170 when Robbie Lawler, we're just talking about Robbie Lawler fighting Nick. Nick's the one that embarrassed him. He was like 25 and one uh, underdog, and he knocked him on the second round. So I guess, what do you think about Nate Diaz staying and fighting at 170? Because it sounds like you're leaning towards, you would rather him stay at 155. That's where he's comfortable at. You wouldn't, Not you wouldn't, me. It, it, That's it, where if, he's comfortable at. If he was to fight for a belt, would you sort of advise him to maybe stay at 155? Would you be comfortable with him fighting a Robbie Lawler? Not in terms of skill, but in terms of the fact that if he wins the belt, he'd have to stay in that division. That's, like I said, that's where he's comfortable at, and that's where he's been fighting at, and that's where he likes to fight at. And I'm with him. You know, I'm right next to his side. You know, uh, they're just bringing that up at 170 because he beat McGregor. When and Robbie Lawler, you know, they like Robbie Lawler, so they want to they want to put him in to make money when he should be fighting Nick to make money because that would be a big money maker right there because Nick knocked him out and Robbie Lawler lost by Nick with the knockout and J- and Jake Shields tapped him out. It was the only two losses I remember he lost, and the rest he's always won. So they were talking about that before, and all of a sudden now they're jumping to Nathan when it should be Nick because they were talking about Nick before that's even happened, about Robbie Lawler fighting Nick. There was rumors going around, you know, and then all of a sudden Nathan beats McGregor. Now they jump Robbie Lawler in there. Mm-hmm. You see what Didn't I'm saying? I see what you're saying. So yeah. let me ask you something. If you could choose between the proposed matchups between RDA, Robbie, or Connor, which which fight do you think would be best for Nate from a coach's perspective? It's not for me to say. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, where the money's at, you know. And 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 if if they want to make money, they should see. What you're saying is what what the media's saying. They want Robbie Lawler when Robbie Lawler should be fighting Nick. You know, because that's where the money money maker should be. Because Nick knocked him out, and they they've seen Robbie Lauder been winning winning streak. You know, it's like McGregor having a winning streak and beating everybody, and then he fights Nathan. And Nathan stops him. Same thing with Robbie Lauder. Robbie Lauder's got a winning streak. Well, who ha- nobody's beating him, but who beat him before? Oh, Nick. Okay, well you know what? Let's get a rematch. That should be a good fight because Nick knocked him on the second round. You know, now they're jumping. I don't know what who's doing this, but that's what I would do. I would mm. say, you know what, let's try to get Nick out here to fight Robbie Lawler. And then have Nathan fight uh, Dos Santos. Have them both on the card. So if, I guess if we're talking about big money fights, ideally, what do you think is the biggest money fight for Nate? It, it doesn't sound like you're really loving the idea of Robbie Lawler. Would it be a, a Dos Anjos fight or a Conor McGregor for Nate Diaz? I wouldn't know. I mean, I don't know. The media knows who, 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 you know, where the money's at. You know, that's... That's what we want. We want with the money because we're tired, we're tired of making chump change. So mm. here's here, Nathan's on top of the world right now. He's got control. So now they have to come to him. Yeah. So well, let's... whoever has, if, if Dana White comes up and says, you know, we can make this much money, and Nathan should step up and say, you know what, I want $3 million. I want $4 million for a purse now. Because, he, you know, he's been throwing around like like, like, like stepchild, you know, and then all of a sudden now he beat the top of the line, and and, and now – they should come to him and say, you know what, this is what we're going to do here. What, how do you feel about it? You know, you know, treat him like they did McGregor. Let me just quickly ask you, Richard, before we jump to this McGregor rematch. Um, obviously, Nate made five hundred thousand dollars for that last minute fight against McGregor. You're obviously yeah. from the boxing world. Do you think he that was enough money that that he got paid for that fight, or do you believe it should have been a lot more, considering how big that fight actually was? They should have offered him a million, like they did to Santos. They should have given him a million because it was two weeks' notice. But they didn't do it. They thought he was going to lose, and so they offered him 500, and and the pay per view, and that, which okay. I said, and he said he's going to take it. I said, okay, you know. But I said, man, I should give you a minute. He says, I know, but then he'll give it to me. But they should have because it was two week notice. But you know, that's that 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 that's that's the way they play. You know, that's that's the name of the game, I guess. That's what what they're doing. And then now, Nathan shut the media up by dominating, and now it's his turn. Now it's Nathan's turn. So let's treat Nathan better than they did McGregor, you know, don't you think? Well, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, f- half a million is is the reported salary. We d- we don't know what kind of bonuses Nate Diaz got. I, if I had to guess, I'd say he probably got one. McGregor did get the million uh, reported. What I want to know, Richard, is with Nate Diaz on a full training camp, how do you think the rematch goes? If you've got if you've got Conor McGregor and Nate Diaz doing the rematch, well, to wait, apparently, do you think the fight ends quicker? How do you think it goes? Well, you you know my answer. What would your answer be? 
I, I just told you, we'll see what Nate lands, we'll see what Connor lands. And he has no injuries, he dominates. Hmm. Dominates easy. He stops people. Or he beats them, you know, he, he, they don't have a chance. And McGregor had a full camp training, and he even moved up weight to get stronger. Nathan was out, you know, having joined himself, going to Cabo, you know, eating and drinking and having fun, and they call him. So if that two weeks, if he dominated, it took him two weeks to dominate a, a guy that's undefeated, that's, that, 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 that's a golden boy, what do you think is going to happen in three months training? Ariel Hawani reported that this fight would be happening at welterweight. I mean, nothing's been confirmed, nothing's been signed just yet, but welterweight seems like a very strange weight class to have both men because obviously McGregor is a featherweight slash wanting to go to lightweight and Diaz fights best at lightweight. What would you think if this fight was at welterweight once again? Well, that, that, uh, what I see is uh, McGregor likes that weight. I guess he likes 170 for some reason. Uh, that, that's what I can think of. He feels comfortable. What do you think it does for Nate? Do you think he fights better? Because obviously if he does fight true well to weights, he's got potentially a size disadvantage. But if he fights McGregor, he doesn't really have that. Do you think it works best for him that he doesn't have to make that weight cut? Well, he's going to cut weight anyway, you know, because he walks around a little heavier than that. So he's going to cut weight too. So uh, I imagine they're both going to cut weight. I'm just wondering, did he cut any weight for the first fight uh, yeah. against McGregor? How, how much did he cut? Uh, I can't remember what who was. He did tell me. Uh, I can't remember. I want to say 185. Because I remember when we spoke to you uh, before the fight, you mentioned how he was on weight. He was at 170. Oh, yeah, because he was already training. Right. But before, when he called me at Cabo, mm -hmm. I can't remember if he said he was 180 or 185. I can't remember. So that would have been about two weeks before the fight. You're saying yeah. it was about 180, 185. He might have been 180, yeah. Oh, wow. In the, in the last few days, do you know if he, if he cut any water weight? No, he was doing fine. He was still eating a little bit and, you know, not starving. And he was drinking water and this, whatever he wanted to drink. I mean, he didn't, he didn't drink sodas or anything like that. But, you know, mm. I mean, he, he had a, a meal. Now, Richard, nothing's been confirmed yet with this rematch, but I'm just wondering, has anyone, has Nate approached you? Have you heard any rumblings? Is this thing official? Has it actually been offered to Nate? Or at the moment, is this all just sort of hype built by the media and there's nothing really on the table yet in terms of actually having this fight at UFC 200 with McGregor? Well, there's no sign yet. There's no, no signed contract. He just said they, they, you know, they, they told him that he might be fighting again, uh, 170 McGregor. So I said, okay. So he's planning on coming into the gym, you know, next week and, and start working out just in case, you know, uh, we, whatever we get, you know, he's not going to be uh, just laying around. Right. So the UFC did, did call him and they did say that they, that is a possibility. Well, I don't know if UFC called him. I just, I just know that he said that, he, that someone told I don't remember who, because we're at the party and he's, and the music's so loud, I'm trying to listen to him. You know, it's, it wasn't easy to listen to. So he just said that, hey, I might be fighting McGregor again. I said, okay. I'll and and ready. He goes, I'll be there next, he said, I'll be there next week. I said, okay. So that's, that's next week. Not, not this week, next week. And this party, I'm just wondering, how long ago was that? It was Friday. Friday, okay. I'm just, yeah, I'm just... He told me he'd be there the week after, yeah. As we wrap up, Richard, final question. You know, we love predictions here on the program. You mentioned the second fight would be very dominant for Diaz, but if you had to put a prediction on it, how would you see Diaz beating McGregor in this rematch? match? Well, he would, get, he would get the win. I know that. How, how, do, you, how do you think we're doing? If, if we're doing official predictions, what would your pick be? Would it be another submission? Would it be a, a knockout or a TKO victory? And, and what round? I can't predict that. I just, I just know he'll get the win. I mean, that's as close to the prediction I can get. I'm not going to say he's going to get a knockout and he gets a submission, or if he gets a submission, he gets a knockout. You know, then it's going to look. I'm going to look wrong. So I just, <laughs> I know he's going to get the win. That's all. I, I know he's going to get the win. Yeah. No, look, no one, no one could have predicted the first fight anyway. So that's absolutely fine, Richard. Again, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, especially considering that we spoke to you not too long ago. Guys, don't forget to check out Richard Perez Boxing on Facebook uh, for more information. Check it out there. How you can train with Richard and of course his fantastic boxing gym. Again, thank you so much for stopping by the show, Richard. It's a pleasure to chat to you. Thank you for calling me. I appreciate it. Hey guys, it's UFC light heavyweight Ryan Bader, and you're listening to Submission Radio. 
All right, guys, joining us here on Submission Radio to give us his thoughts on some of the happenings in MMA is none other than the senior editor from MMA Fighting. You know him from his Monday morning analysis, MMA Beat, and his radio show. It's a pleasure to welcome Luke Thomas on Submission Radio. Luke, welcome for the first time to the program. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Huge, huge pleasure. I feel like it's long overdue, so we're super pumped. Getting straight into it. Actually, before we dive into this week's topics, we've got to get your thoughts on MMA now becoming legal in New York. It's obviously big news, but for fans here down under who maybe don't quite understand what the commotion is about, can you explain to them what does this mean and why is it such a big deal, Luke? Yeah, I mean, I think every country and then every state here in the United States is going to have um, a different relationship with how mixed martial arts develops and grows and, and what it means in their communities. But, you know, look, New York is uh, – it's 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 a special place in the country. New York City is my favorite city in the, in the world, really, and uh, I don't say that lightly, but it's more than that. It's, it's you know, it's it, – imagine if someone was like hamburgers are banned in uh, in Queensland. Mm. Hamburgers are banned, and or you know, just pick a New Zealand. You'd be like, "What? Why? Why is that the case?" Um, it, it is getting with that overturn, and it's the easily the number one media market in in uh, this country, arguably the world. Getting that overturn is finally shedding the last, you know, the 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 vestiges of MMA's sordid past here in this country. It finally washes that clean in a way that um, has been, you know, it's been a scarlet letter for a little while, and. Again, I, is it going to change the lives of people where you're from on a day-to-day basis? No, prob- probably not. But it definitely means a lot here, both practically and symbolically. Mm. Now, Luke, we hear Madison Square Garden shows ain't cheap to run. I'm just wondering, are you expecting New York to almost become a second Vegas? Or are we looking at just another location where the UFC does one or two shows a year? Yeah, I think it's more of the latter. There might be some early enthusiasm, especially mm-hmm. as they go to other parts of New York. But, you know, look, here's the truth about it, and people in New York are going to get mad at me if I, when they hear this. New York City is phenomenal. I don't know if you guys have ever been. The five boroughs are like nothing else in the world. But the rest of the state blows. It's not interesting at all. Uh, Albany sucks. Syracuse <laughs> sucks. Rochester sucks. So the truth of the matter is, They'll do really big shows once in a while at Bassin Square Garden because there is a, me- a measure of prestige to that, um, and they'll do some fight nights at upstate New York. But I don't, I don't suspect. Like for example, Scott Coker has made it explicit that they have a home in San Jose, California, and they have a secondary home in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I don't think you'll see the UFC identify New York or Madison Square Garden or any real place outside of Vegas as any kind of second home. Wow, I, I love the honesty, and, and Luke, you're probably going to have a whole bunch of people to uh, to block as soon as this comes out. It's in- all right, because I don't think people in Alb- Albany might listen to Submission Radio, so it might be safe for now, Luke. It might leak out one day. <laughs> they, they, they probably all have dial-up internet anyway, so I'm not too concerned. <laughs> yeah, it's Chael signing on the internet in Brazil all over again. Now, in other big news, Jonathan Snowden tweeted out about some rumors that China Media Capital is in talks with the UFC to buy the promotion. Apparently, they're looking at a $6 billion valuation. There's been a bunch of rumors floating around about the UFC possibly being on sale for years. So, you know, of course, it's unconfirmed. But what do you think of the rumors, Luke? Yeah, I've tried to look into them, too. I can't dig up a whole lot. The best I can say for it, actually, is I'd refer you to the work of um, John Nash. Mm -hmm. He wrote a piece for Bloody Elbow, essentially trying to connect the financial dots between this group in China, this uh, investment and uh, equity firm. Um, and the UFC. And, you know, look, the financial world has a lot of different entanglements. But I guess the long story short is, and without overcomplicating it, there are some interesting ways in which you can connect the dots between the two that are fairly straightforward, that are fairly linear. Does that in and of itself, you know, serve as some sort of confirmation? I don't know. Six billion seems awful high to me. Um, That would be, I don't know what Australian rules football teams are worth, but that would be the cost of, you know, two or three American uh, NFL franchises, I, that seems very high, but nevertheless, if they can get it, great. It, it just, it's just going to be very interesting that if and when the UFC does sell, um, do, does leadership retain at least some kind of executive control in terms of running operations? If not, who takes over? It would be a massive, massive day if and when that ever happens. Mm, I'm just curious, Luke, and obviously we, don't, we all don't really know very much, but your thoughts on who is China media capital and why would they be interested in the UFC? And if the sale did happen... How much do you think it would change the product that we see now? 
Yeah, as I understand it, they've been trying to get into the world of um, sport. I mean, I, this, this is a financial question that's a little bit above my pay grade. But mm-hmm. again, from some of the things I've looked around and seen, they've been trying to get involved into various different uh, media opportunities, music, uh, live entertainment. Uh, they have a, you know, look like any other investment company uh, and firm and for venture capitalists, they're going to have a, a diversified portfolio to some extent. This is not directly a Silicon Valley kind of thing where it's only in, into, into – um, to one thing, but you know why they'd be interested in the UFC? Your guess is as good as mine. Um, you know they've obviously invested in other sports properties, like the Chinese Super League for soccer. Uh, so that would potentially fit in it. Although the you know I don't know if you guys follow soccer, but the exorbitant amount of money that's being poured into that um, to retain and attract talent has been kind of an interesting dynamic. So uh, I can't speak to their motivations other than look, I am sure that as you guys well know too, it's an attractive property. Twenty the last year was a really, really strong year. They had a tough 2014, but they rebounded nicely. So far, 2016 has proven to be a very fruitful one as well. Uh, you can do worse than invest in something that was down $40 million and is up potentially $6 billion. Yeah, it'll, it'll be a very interesting day if that happens. Let's quickly jump to UFC Brisbane, Luke, where we were ringside for what we thought was a disappointing performance by referee Steve Percival, who let the Lombard Magnify go for way, way, way too long. We've heard your um, Money Morning Analyst show and obviously the, the live chat where you talk a lot about referees and things like that, suggesting that you could do a whole podcast based off uh, interviewing referees and, and officials. What was your reaction when you saw Steve's late stoppage and what would be, you know, in your opinion, a fair sort of punishment for him after UFC Brisbane, if, if punishments were to actually exist in this world? So who regulates the commission in Brisbane? Who, who, who is the uh, defining authority there? I believe we have some kind of commission here, but I don't really think there's anyone that really regulates it down here. Casper, do you know much about it? No, I think it's, uh, to my understanding, it's kind of like in America where you have, say, the Nevada State Athletic Commission. I don't think anyone really regulates that commission. I think it's the same thing here in Australia. Okay. Um, Because I know that there is, I think New South Wales has um, uh, at least one of the better commissions in the area, but I can't can't say that for certain. I mean, look, I, I say this all the time. It's not that... There's really no defense of what Steve did. There's just not. There's not. There's not. You can't look at that and say Hector Lombard took a record beating, literally a numerically measurable record beating, and say that the referee handled this in a way that is defensible. And defensible is going to mean a wide range of different scenarios. It's going to mean uh, the very, very. You know, did he just clear the minimum of acceptability all the way up to an outstanding performance by a referee? Say. Herb Dean's performance in Frank Mir versus Tim Sylvia. That's that's the level. That's the that's the range of okay. He is clearly outside of that. Um, but the problem is, it's not really clear what you're going to do about it. Like in Australia, as it is here, it's a volunteer army to to uh, the guys who wish to do this sort of thing and spend their time and get paid very little to do it. So if you overly uh, punish Steve Percival, what happens? Um, let's say you remove him, right? Well, now you've got other people who might be groomed to take that role, or you might just be a man down, and now you have less resources to tackle the job that you need. This is a common scenario in a lot of different places. They simply just don't have the resources, or they have guys who you know, might be basically as good as Steve but have far less veteran experience. Now, Percival is certainly no stranger to controversy, be it missing groin shots or any other number of um, you know, mistakes he's had. You can Google all of them. It's much easier as a referee to be known for a bad performance than to be praised for a good one. But I guess I would just say, you know, obviously, some measure of counseling is in order. But the fact of the matter is, he's not going to get better with less time in the cage. He needs to have more time with other shows so that when the UFC comes back around, they can make effective use of him. If he be- becomes you know, beyond repair, well, then you can move on. But I would not recommend... Um, cutting back on his time other than cutting back on his UFC time and having him work some of these smaller cards while advising him that, you know, dude, you're, you're really letting this go on too long. Yeah, certainly. It should be like a drug driver's course where they have to go back and sit through a couple of different kind of courses and maybe go somewhere and go through some kind of seminar. But there's some great points there, Luke. Now, before we get your thoughts on the craziness that could be Diaz versus McGregor 2 at UFC 200, Nate Diaz was on UFC tonight 
with Kenny Florian and Michael Bisping and explained why he thinks the pursuit of a title is a fairy tale, mentioning the best fighters in the world aren't getting paid the best money. We just want to get your thoughts on his comments. Do you believe the UFC title is still as meaningful these days as it once was? Is there a fairy tale pursuit when you look at champions like Demetrius Johnson, who although are successful champions, their paychecks are a lot smaller than the McGregors of the division? Yeah, it's a great question. I actually had that topic on my radio show today. Um, look, I think for the Diaz brothers, they're not going to be those guys who can, in a, in a linear way, uh, ascend through a division and then maintain a top position against all comers. They're just not a St. Pierre type. It's never going to be that way. However, if given the right opportunity, they can beat certain guys at that level um, time to time. And so for them, you know, to me, it's not an accident that they train in a boxing gym. I mean, they train in an MMA gym too, of course, but they train in a boxing gym. They are uh, have a boxing coach. They have a boxing sensibility when it comes to their own matchmaking. It's a very much a boxing model. I don't think other guys can follow that to the same extent they could, and I think if they did, it would essentially undo the fabric of how UFC matchmaking works. But UFC has been very rig- – not rigid exactly in a bad way, but they've been very disciplined about maintaining a model – built on hierarchy, built on the championship having value, independent of who's there. Now, obviously, that can be enhanced if you have a St. Pierre or a Silva in his prime, less so, even though he's a, you know, a decorated guy in, in Demetrius Johnson. But to answer your question, it might not have the same exact value as it had before. Conor McGregor is certainly blurring those lines, as is Nate Diaz. But it clearly does hold a ton of value in ways um, that is still important. Those models of the weight classes being as rigid and the matchmaking following that path is still quite valuable. I think they should make allowances for guys who don't fit that, like a cyborg Justino. She doesn't really fit that bantamweight model, mm-hmm. not just because they don't have that 145-pound weight class. But I, I like the idea of really maintaining weight class title value and then allowing outliers to shine in ways that, look, it's not in the UFC's interest to bury Nate Diaz on a Fox Sports 1 prelim card. It's in their interest to make use of him. They just got to be a little creative with it. Very good point. Well, speaking of Diaz, it seems like the UFC may go with this rematch between Connor and Nate at UFC 200. W- what do you think about this rematch, and is it a good idea? Do you guys like it? Well, no, we discussed it, and yeah, we don't like it at all because just basically and uh, very quickly, we felt like Nate Diaz had got a lot of star power from his win over Conor McGregor, and he, that can be used against another matchup, another big matchup. We just don't see if McGregor loses twice to Nate Diaz, uh, you know, a lot of the hype die, dies down if he beats Nate Diaz, and a lot of that good that was done at UFC 196 goes away. So in a lot of ways, we just don't see how it benefits the UFC in a lot of ways. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of risk there. Um, I, I think I share your sentiments generally. Uh, um, I, I get it. You know, here in the United States, I, I don't know what the buzz is like where you're at, but here in the United States, like Nate Diaz has never been hotter. Mm. Um, there are a lot of casual fans who are like, "Sure, let's do it again." I think McGregor has, and he could be right, you know, but McGregor has convinced himself that the performance was in some ways aberrant. And so if given the opportunity to redo it, it might look different. And, and it might. You know, I, I, I certainly wouldn't discount it. But I'm with you. At, <clears throat> the, the problem was, and I think I understand where the UFC is coming from here, matchmaking Diaz was a little bit hard because the welterweight cue to get Robbie Lawler is thick and full. Carlos Condit might come back. GSP might come back. So that makes it really difficult to just jump Nate that direction. Plus, Nick Diaz versus Lawler 2 is much more interesting to me than Nate Diaz Lawler 1. And then against Dos Anjos, I just don't – this is what I'm talking about. This is not a great matchup for Nate Diaz. Mm. So it's like where does he really go in a way that it enables you to maximize, um, as you pointed out correctly, this, this, uh, that, that catalyst moment at 196. It's not really clear right now. So I'm not saying I justify it or that justifies it or that I like it. I don't. Or it doesn't interest me. But I guess I kind of understand where they're going with a little bit. The other thing is that this fight is at welterweight, but neither fighter are really a true welterweight. So why do, why do the fighter that weight? Have you got any theories yeah. on this, Luke? No, I really don't. Other than McGregor superstitiously might have said, what were the conditions the first time? Let's redo those conditions. Because if they do it again, and let's just say for whatever reason, McGregor has uh, significantly more success. If it's at 155, some might say oh, it's that well, it's that change that adjusted everything. It it brought Nate's size back down to scale. It maximized 
um, McGregor's in a way that it didn't previously. It was a healthier balance. I think McGregor's trying to say, let's set up exactly the same conditions we had before, <clears throat> and let's try it again and see what happens again. I think in McGregor's mind, there's a ton of value to this fight because it's, it's, a, it's a do-over for him. It's a big money fight, and all big fights for him are big money, but you know this one is one among many. Um, and it's, you know, he, he is a guy that thrives after loss traditionally, after the Joe Duffy loss, and then after the physical loss of his ACL, he has reinvented and repaired himself in ways few guys can. So I think he sees a lot of value in that, and he wants to establish the same kind of baseline conditions that existed before. Mm-hmm. I'm just curious, Luke, because obviously over in Brisbane, we were around a lot of dudes like John Anik and uh, Dennis Bermudez who basically mentioned their thoughts about how they think McGregor should vacate the featherweight title because it's sort of being held up at the moment. What do you think uh, should happen with a featherweight title? Because at the moment, it seems a little bit unclear as to when McGregor will move back down to featherweight, if he can move down to featherweight. We've spoken to Gunnar Nelson a couple of weeks ago who said these weight cuts are limited. There's not many left. I mean, what kind of scenario do you think would have to happen for him to vacate that belt? Yeah, I think what he's trying to do is set up a golden parachute so that um, if he has to leave 145, he can do it under uh, great conditions. Um, he can either do it, you know, I think the hope for him was to have taken the title at 196 from Dos Anjos or, um, you know, to beat Nate Diaz. Now, again, it's at 170, but still, Nate, you know, beat a guy who's a recognized contender in that division in a way that it sets him up for, um, you know, the top of that division should he be forced to leave. I think he's trying to set up conditions uh, outside of it before he has to either, you know, move on naturally from size or if he loses. He's essentially trying to plan an exit on some condition. It's, and he wasn't really able to do that at all, obviously, at 196. Um, I'm sympathetic to the argument that he looks like death on the scale when he tries to go to 145. <laughs> mm. But if you want to hold the title, there are just simply some certain obligations. I think you can put it on hold a little bit. I think if they have to do this Diaz fight for whatever purpose, like some have mentioned, maybe getting McGregor versus um, Edgar at Madison Square Garden, that would be massive. That would mm. be super, super massive. Okay. Those are extenuating circumstances that will, in my mind, allow some kind of bending of the rules. But, you know, uh, folks have often pointed out, my colleague mentioned this, Chuck Mindenhall, like folks have pointed out that there were times where um, there were long lapses between fights for Jose Aldo. And that's true, except he was either injured or whatever the case may be. But he never left the division, even when they booked that Aldo versus Pettis fight, I believe that was at 145, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. So guys were coming to him. McGregor seems to be going to other places. If that's really your ambition, that's fine, man. There's nothing wrong with it. But you cannot hold up a division that way if that's really your ultimate aim. So if they don't make that fight in the third, fourth quarter of 2016, then you know that title needs to be vacated for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Final thing I want to talk about with you, Luke. Uh, this past weekend, we were on a hand witness yet another impressive KO win for Mark Hunt in Brisbane. Bas Rudin actually spoke to the fight nerd and mentioned that if Hunt trained seriously, he could become a UFC champion at 41 years old. Does the Super Samoan have one last title run left in him? What do you think? Yeah, you know what? I think so. And I think I kind of slept on him a little bit. Um, I thought after that Antonio Silva fight, I mean, he won that easily. But I, I don't know. To me, the fight was a little weird. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I thought that he was a little hesitant and you know he was coming off of the uh, the beating that Steve Miocic gave him you know and I man you go back and you watch that fight I remember on Twitter I, sometimes the way in which Twitter reacts to a fight informs your judgment over over many years like for example I remember when Twitter blew up when Michael Chandler fought Eddie Alvarez people were freaking out about it for the very mm-hmm. first time um, and I remember that one people were like Jesus when are they going to stop this fight you know Mark Hunt took a record beating in that one, too. And I thought, ah, I don't know if he's the same. Truth is, he looked pretty good to me against Frank Mir, man. And again, Frank Mir is certainly a lesser version of himself. But but I didn't see that from Mark Hunt this time. I, I think I, I kind of buried him a little too early. I was wrong for it, and I, I'm acknowledging it publicly. And, um, you know, his right hand looked plenty potent to me. He didn't physically look any worse. He was His takedown defense has just gotten really, really good. And look. He's already tested his upper bound limits, and he kind of fell up short, like against uh, Verdum and like against Los Santos and like against Miocic. But the division changes, and he's still there. He seemed quite potent to me. Uh, I would like to see him go for one more run if he can. If anything, I think he's earned it. And people love Mark Hunt over here. Let me tell you, he is a very popular guy. I'm not saying he's a household name, but the MMA fans in North America, they love Mark Hunt, and, and it would be really cool to at least 
You know, give him one more try, see where he can do with it. Mm. I'm just curious, Luke, have you read his book, his autobiography? I never read books about fighters, ever. Uh, okay, well, this one is very, <laughs> very good. I think um, you, you, if you do read one, definitely check it out. One of the things that we took from it is a lot of the fights that he went into, he didn't even have proper training whatsoever. Some fights, he actually sat ringside and drank alcohol before he jumped in for his kickboxing fights, actually sitting at the ringside VIP seats drinking, and then he came in the ring and fought. So one of the things me and Casper noticed, because we've been spending a lot of time around him, we were there in Adelaide, is... Um, in Adelaide against Stipe, you know, he was water loading before the fight. He was trying to cut weight just to make the heavyweight division and he just wasn't in the right shape. But if he's in the right shape and he has the right training, he can be an absolute killer. I guess the big question is, and I mean, this is the big question to us here at Submission Radio is how seriously will he take his training of this part of his life? At the moment, he seems to be taking it pretty seriously, but I guess we'll see what happens. My question to you, however, Luke, is... I mean, the heavyweight division is pretty much booked out, but if you could put Mark against one of the winners of Overeem versus Arlovsky or Roth- Rothwell versus JDS, who would you choose? Man, that's a really tough call. Wow. Um, I think, well, I'll say this. I would like, jeez, oh, uh, n- none of those are bad, right? Uh, Hunt versus Arlovsky sounds awesome. Hunt versus Overeem sounds awesome. Hunt JDS too if JDS gets by Ben Rothwell because that that'll be a redemptive moment for him. Mm. That would be awesome. And then you've got uh, who was the other one? I'm not thinking of here. Rothwell. Hunt versus uh, say again. Ben Rothwell. Ben Rothwell. I mean, those are all bangers. All, all, all of those are are great. I guess if I had to rank them, I would say if Arlovsky wins, that would be the most interesting one to me because both of those guys are not too keen on the takedown. So that would really be. A slugfest. I guess uh, Arlovsky's chin would come into play there. Um, but Rothwell is not as interesting to me. But if he wins, that changes the equation. JDS, I don't think he's going to win. So we'll see how that goes. But for sure, I guess my number one there, because of the takedown threat and he can strike, would be Overeem. And Overeem's lighter mm-hmm. on his feet these days. I think Overeem versus Hunt, man. I mean, I can't imagine a mixed martial arts fan not being just crazy about that one. So if, they, if Overeem wins, then it'll give him a title shot. Let's do that. For sure. And obviously, Arlovsky being the only one of those that wouldn't be a rematch. So it's interesting which one Mark Hunt would take because, you know, he love, he loves rematches, but obviously he doesn't really care who he gets as far as, you know, picking fights. One thing that I actually want to ask you, Luke, is you mentioned that you don't ever read books by fighters. Why is that? Well, I don't mean to disparage them, uh, but I, I think of it this way, right? If you have 100 attention dollars, okay, and you can only spend your attention dollars each day a certain way. How are you going to spend it? And I talk to these guys all the time, like you guys do. Um, they do have some interesting lives, obviously. I mean, I've spent my life talking and covering them. That's what I do. But when it comes to reading books, I strictly keep that to uh, history or politics or current affairs in some kind of way. It's only because I'm so involved in this world that I, I continuously worry that I'll become culturally illiterate if I don't just <laughs> just prioritize. Like if you look at my Kindle, it's I'm reading nothing but books about the Second Amendment right now. Uh, we have obviously, you know, um, uh, uh, guns are a big issue here in America. I'll leave it at that. And yeah, say. yeah. So 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 I'm reading constantly about that because if I don't, I, I'll know nothing about the world in which we live. And here's the truth. Last thing I'll say about this. Part of success in mixed martial arts journalism is bringing knowledge about the outside world to bear in relevant ways inside MMA. Guys who have a stats background coming in and bringing it in. Guys who might have a photography background. You look at Esther Lin and Casey. Mm. They were not MMA fans. They were photographers and videographers who got into MMA. And reading about the Second Amendment is not going to make that uh, relevant. But I just mean knowing about the outside world and how it works and then bringing that knowledge to bear. If you're an MMA journalist out there or aspiring to be, I, I strongly recommend that. Well, speaking of attention dollars, Luke, I'm not sure how many you have left over, but you know, we <laughs> wasted some of ours on Batman versus Superman. Before we wrap this thing up, we have to ask you, have you watched the movie yet? I've not, and I had a movie reviewer on today that panned it. It's that bad, huh? Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> Save your pennies, man. Maybe use them on something else. Definitely don't waste them on this one. All right. Well, I'm still going to see, I'm still gonna see uh, Suicide Squad when it comes out, and I'm still going to see... Uh, Captain America versus uh, Iron Man. Was it Civil War? The Avengers Civil War? I'm still kind of excited for that. 
I think there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, Captain America. And yeah, Suicide Squad, just for curiosity's sake. But yeah, I mean, we spoke before you came on about uh, your sports addiction. I-, I think your time is better spent there watching sports than uh, Batman vs Superman. <laughs> we'll be we'll be reviewing it in just a second. But for now, Luke, thank you so much for taking the time to join us, guys. Make sure to check out Luke's Monday morning analysis available on YouTube via the MMA Fighting channel and pretty much anywhere where podcasts can be found. And follow him on Twitter at SBN Luke Thomas. Luke, again, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. You do an awesome podcast. It was an honor to be a guest. Thank you very much. And there you guys go, Luke Thomas. Now, Casper, as you mentioned, we'll be breaking down the Batman movie, the Batman vs. Superman movie. There's a lot to talk about in this one. I mean, let's be honest here. We watched it uh, not too long ago, and uh, afterwards we sat around in the parking lot just discussing some of the plot holes and our thoughts on the movie. I think we s- sat around or stood around, and this was late at night. This was like around 10, 30, 11 p.m. We stood around for a good half an hour, 40 minutes just discussing All the issues that we had with it, so no doubt about it, the listeners are going to have to listen to it now and hear our thoughts. I mean, where do we kick this off? Where where should we kick this breakdown off? Well, I'm just wondering, how are we doing it? Because I know a lot of people haven't seen it yet. There's one of two ways we can do it. We can give a general sort of dual, double movie review like we normally do where we don't really spoil anything, or do we really get into it and start you know spoiling the movie but yeah. discussing what what I, exactly I, is wrong with it we hate the spoilers you and me we hate this so maybe we'll do spoiler free mm-hmm. um and we'll give our thoughts on it without giving any like too much away for sure yeah um yeah we, we can we can we can take turns as usual what, what do you want to kick it off do you want to give the people your thoughts first so just sort of what's rolling around in my mind and, and why I, and I think most of these things we sort of share, you know, each other's sentiments. I think obviously what we discussed the other day, we, we realized that we're on the same page, but one of the biggest problems is the movie is built as a Batman versus Superman. It's not really that. There are other characters that are introduced in the movie, but the biggest issue is pretty much all the characters are very thin, very one dimensional. You have a Batman that isn't really a Batman at all. I mean... He, sh- he shoots guns. Anyone who knows anything about Batman knows that Batman hates guns. He kills people in this movie, which is massively, massively against his code. What else does he do? He- Batman's known as, you know, the greatest detective in the world. He doesn't really do any detective work. He's also like a stealth ninja, and he doesn't really do that. Or any fight scene that he has is pretty much, other than one at the very end of the movie, it's pretty much in through the front door, forget stealth, I'm just going to go in on my big, you know, Batmobile as if he's driving, you know, a, a big ass ute or a big truck trying to park in a Walmart. So that's my biggest issue. Why don't you go with, say, Superman? What did you what did you have issues with there? Oh, man, Superman. I mean, look, I understand Superman's a difficult character to portray. And that's why we've seen so many terrible Superman movies like Superman Returns in 2006. Man mm. of Steel, people didn't love that movie. But look, I saw a lot of potential in it. There was a little bit of psychology behind it. The first half was actually decent. In this movie, though, Superman, I mean, obviously, Batman's the detective. He's supposed to be the smarter one. But Superman is just the biggest idiot. He just stands there. I mean, Henry... Cavill worked very hard in this movie to get in shape, you know, look the role, but he just had the worst facial expressions throughout this movie. Mm. I mean, plot holes galore. You, there, there are parts where you're just like dumbfounded. Like we we can't spoil anything, but just look at the things that he does. Just common sense. A, a five-year-old would have better common sense than the Superman in this movie. And just the stares that he gives the villains and Throughout the scenes, you just it just looks like there's nothing going on in his head. Like it's absolutely empty. He he looks like some a piece of muscle that someone uses pretty much on the side. He has very little personality in this movie as well. You don't really get to know who Clark Kent is. I mean, Henry Cavill, I, I like him in some movies. I know you don't like Man from Uncle, but I actually like Man from Uncle. I actually think he's got some acting ability. But in this movie, I mean, his performance is a lot worse than The Man of Steel. You just did not know much about Clark Kent, except for really the fact that he flies around in a Superman suit and has superpowers. And the other thing is they didn't portray his powers accurately at all. I mean, people don't realize how Superman's powers work. I mean, a lot of casual fans just realize that he flies, maybe has super strength and something else. They didn't really show people everything that Superman could do. They didn't really explain what Superman, how he ticks, what makes him powerful, how he recovers. The whole thing, I mean, Zack Snyder, I guess he thought people would go in there and just sort of know everything. And the truth is, no one really does. I mean, even yourself and myself, Casper, big comic book fans, don't know that much about Superman. 
We didn't even know everything about it. So th that was one of the definite things that sort of upset me about it. Yes, yeah, so you've got very watered down versions of both Batman and Superman. The movie also introduces other characters. Uh, I'm not really going to spoil anything per se. I will say that Lex Luthor is in the movie. He's one of the main characters there. Like, I'm I'm not the biggest Superman fan. I would definitely say I'm more of a Batman fan than a Superman fan. But from everything that I've seen in Lex Luthor, and I could be wrong, so please correct us if we are, but Lex Luthor is meant to be this, like, genius supervillain. And here, he's literally like Jim Carrey in uh, Batman Forever playing Edward Enigma, like a crazy, kooky, insane version played by Jesse Eisenhower. Uh, he's got, wait, Eis no, Eisenberg, sorry. He's got long hair and he just seems like a nut. He doesn't seem really all that smart. He just seems like somebody who literally escaped from a, a mental asylum. So he's one of the characters. Again, another weak, weird, watered down version. Um, there are other characters that are introduced and I think are very unnecessarily introduced. It looks like they've just sort of stuck them in there to sort of set up a sequel, but they don't really do anything. The music is absolutely horrendous. There were moments during certain fight scenes that we were absolutely laughing because of how ridiculous the music is. The other thing is, and I'll let you take over for this one, just the motives for every character. What about that, Dennis? The motives just did not make sense. The movie was convoluted. No one really knew what was going on. The audience was confused. The characters looked confused. Uh, mm. the, the script and the dialogue was terrible. Just nothing made sense. And we can't spoil anything, but what you guys will notice is you go from one scene with the characters being in a certain place to the next scene and they're in a completely different place. Like it just did not make sense. And what Christopher Nolan did that was so great in the Batman movies was he humanized Batman. He explained to people how this could be possible. He made it realistic and that made you connect with the movie. It made you sort of see what was going on and sort of feel it. In this movie, Zack Snyder basically makes everything absolutely unrealistic. It just takes you out of the movie even more, makes you question how the hell is this person here and then he's here, just changed How's Batman here and now? He's here. The whole thing was absolutely ridiculous. And I mean, I must say, look, Zack Snyder, he has a history of superhero movies. For people that don't know, he did Watchmen, which was a very highly touted movie. He did do 300. I don't really think it's a superhero movie, but people really enjoyed it. But he, man, he really dropped the ball in this movie. And he already is doing the Justice League Part 1, the Justice League Part 2. As a director, he's a producer in Aquaman, The Flash, Wonder Woman, Suicide Squad. So, look, the fact that he's not directing those other movies, I think, is a plus. But I would be very, very worried about these other Justice League movies because it is like going to a buffet, getting all your favorite food and mashing it up in a plate on the plate and not enjoying any of it. That, that's probably the best way I could describe the feeling I had when I was watching what was going on with the plot and the scenes in this movie, cast. Well, that's a good point. The movie is really long, and they just, they try and cram so much into this movie. They're, they're you know, doing this whole Batman vs. Superman thing. You've got Lex Luthor. You've got a whole bunch of other characters being introduced. You've got so many stories. You've got, you know, I, I didn't really know whether this was a superhero movie, an action movie, a comedy, a romance. There, there are so many stories going at the same time. I found it really, really hard to follow. Um, add to that the really, really weak motives for all the action, the, you know, anything that takes place in the movie, you think like, really? All this because of, you know, some really shitty motivation? And if you look at what Chris Van Olen did, he took a whole movie just to explain Batman's motives and why he does what he does in Batman Begins. And then in The Dark Knight, it progressed. And then in Dark Knight Rises. And they, they each were pretty long movies. I think in total, you've got at least, I don't know, six, maybe seven hours of Batman in those three movies. Imagine if he did all of that, try to have the Dark uh, the, the Joker and Bane and uh, who else did he have? Scarecrow and the League of Shadows. Imagine if he tried to do all those story arcs in one movie in about two and a half hours. And that's pretty much what this movie is, Batman vs. Superman. Just a million different things going on. No segues. One second there's an action scene and with action music. Two seconds later, it's a love scene with love music. It's just completely, completely all over the place. And I believe the word you used was endure when talking about Ben Affleck as Batman oh, over the man. next few movies, whether it's Justice League or Suicide Squad. And when when Heath Ledger was announced as Joker years ago, I remember everybody freaked out and were like, this is terrible. What is he going to do? And then he proved us wrong. 
Same thing with Ben Affleck when he was announced as Ben uh, as as Batman. Everybody rolled their eyes, was like, "This is going to be terrible." And it was on to Ben Affleck to try and prove us wrong. Like you mentioned, they got into phenomenal, phenomenal physical shape. I actually was reading in a magazine about their their workouts and you know what they had to do, training you know three hours a day, etc. Crazy diets around their movie schedule. So they obviously were committed, but it's pretty much exactly what you would have hoped it was in in terms of Ben Affleck as a Batman. And yeah, Henry Cavill, I'm starting to lose a lot of faith in in him and his acting in, in general because I've never enjoyed a Superman movie, I'll be honest, even the old school ones. Maybe you, th- you might think I'm a bit biased there. To me, this felt like a Superman movie with Batman in it as opposed to a Batman and Superman movie. Although it was, yeah. it was, like, it was like a Batman, Superman and a million other characters. It's interesting with Ben Affleck as well because, I mean, uh, he was probably the most disappointing performance for me. It was actually – you didn't see him as Bruce Wayne. You just saw Ben Affleck in a Batman yeah. suit yeah. throughout the thing. Like when he had the Batman suit, it's just, just like, hey, look, there's Ben Affleck in a Batman suit. That's mm. not Batman. That's Ben Affleck in a Batman suit. I was looking through Ben Affleck's acting and the previous movies that he did, and for me, no doubt about it, the two movies that stand out as my favorites are The Town and Argo. Both movies where Ben Affleck does a spectacular job, you know, as his character. But when I was thinking about those movies, I also realized he directed those movies as well. Mm. You see, and that could play a big part into why he was so good. Because when you're directing a movie, you sort of know know the movie a lot more. You know the characters a lot more. You understand where it's going. And that gives, if you're playing in the movie, that gives your character more understanding. It gives you more understanding in the character and how important every dialogue is. In this movie, it's like Ben Affleck had never read a, a Batman comic book. Mm. I mean, when he played Bruce Wayne, he was not Bruce Wayne. He was Ben Affleck trying to play Bruce Wayne. And I didn't even see, I mean, I don't know what he was looking at. It's so easy. Go out, look at Bruce Wayne, look at the great job that was done in the Christopher Nolan movies when they portrayed Bruce Wayne and he's like this playboy and he's got these women. That's a part of the Bruce Wayne character. Bruce Wayne is always trying to cover up the fact that he's Batman by making everybody think that he's like this playboy that's flying around with all these different women, going to all these huge functions, doing all these extravagant things. Here he was just a guy in a suit. Now he was supposed to be an older Bruce Wayne is what we think was supposed to happen. There was no explanation about Batman taking a break. There was no explanation Mm. about Batman being like really old. He moved around like he was 20 years old, quite frankly. And Alfred looked like he was about the same age as him. The yeah. whole thing was just absolutely ridiculous. And I feel like to play a good Batman, you have to play a very good Bruce Wayne because Bruce Wayne is where you see the actual emotion. It's where you see the pain, the pain behind his eyes, the pain in mm. his soul for everything that's happened. I mean, everybody's seen in the trailer. He walks past uh, Robin's suit where Joker's spray painted stuff on top of it. I mean, there's no reference to anything, guys. I mean, this isn't a spoiler, but in his character, he doesn't carry the pain of losing a Robin. He doesn't carry the pain of being Batman for what, like 30 years or like 20 years Mm. or something like that. It's like a guy whose story arc just started with what you see at the beginning of beginning of the movie. It was just super disappointing. And then when he was wearing that Batman suit, he did not move around like Batman. The action sequences were super I mean, that was super, super disappointing. He was super slow. The CGI was terrible. When he was wearing the big, big metal Batman suit that everybody's seen in the trailer, I mean, I'm not going to say anything about it, but everybody's going to be disappointed with the whole, that whole sequence. It he was looked just, like he was wearing those Skecher shoes. You know those corrective shoes that people wear? It looked oh, like those. A- absolutely. It was just the whole thing was just not Batman whatsoever. It was. I've seen people at Movie World, which is a theme park here in Gold Coast, Australia, the play Batman, that have done a much better job of Ben Affleck. Seriously. <laughs> and I'm not even kidding around. Seriously, they've done a better job of Batman. I mean, it, it's a hard task. You put the mask on and you can't see your expression, but it has to be in your eyes, it has to be in your voice, it has to be in your movement. You have to work hard at it. And it, there were times the Batman was just standing around like an idiot, mm. just staring at people. I mean, when was Bat- when does Batman stand around? staring at people when does when do you see batman when it's not important if batman's there he says something he does something then he disappears he's Mm. never just standing around it was like it was just absolutely ridiculous It was like they were loitering on the corner of a shopping center it was just ridiculous there was a lot of dumb moments where you're just yelling at the screen fear you never want to feel like you're smarter than the superhero like when you watch a nolan 
Batman movie, you're like, ah, that's what he's doing. You sort of figure out, okay, that's his grand plan. I wouldn't have figured that out, perhaps. But here, you're yelling at the screen like, Batman, do this, Batman, do that. And you see, like, as a superhero, how did you not foresee that happening? Superman does some incredibly stupid, questionable things in the movie. You were just like, how did you not figure this out? I almost feel like this is... A, a kids movie really and i'm honestly i'm a i'm a ben affleck fan i really like his movies um i think you already mentioned argo right i yeah. like all the all the ones uh, that he did with kevin smith um that one with justin timberlake what was that one uh that was runner 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 i like that i i'm a big ben affleck fan uh paycheck even i like his movies but you're right in this movie is basically just like watching ben affleck suit up as batman i can't get over batman using guns he hates guns. He destroys guns. And here he is actively shooting people, literally killing people. There's a moment where he tries to get Superman with guns. Like, what? Everybody knows that's not going to work. Just, yeah, absolutely terrible. Super, super disappointed. Don't don't waste your money on this movie unless you're going to see it just for curiosity's sake. If you're going to see And then anything- watch it in 3D. Do not watch it. That was it even worse. The, yeah. We, we, so, all right. So, the situation was this. So we, we've got a group of friends, close group of friends. We lo- love to go to the movies together, watch the movies. It's, it's a fun thing that we do. It's great. We love the movies. But um, one of our friends suggested, let's do 3D. 3D is great. 3D, 3D yeah. is unbelievable. We he's go with communicated from the group now. We don't talk to him anymore. That's right. He's being cut out. He's, like, he's on an island somewhere. And we go in there, and as crappy as everything looked, with the 3D glasses, it was even worse. And there was... An, it was like terribly done 3D. It was like, to me, I've seen, it was like the same 3D when you turn your glasses on your TV, basically. Yeah. The, no, no better. No better at all. Oh, yeah, and that's not even an exaggeration, literally. I've got a Samsung TV that makes anything 3D if, if you want it to be. And uh, this this whole 3D looked like an afterthought. The good thing is we didn't pay any extra for 3D. So I don't know if they're making any extra money off it or what. But it, it definitely wasn't a movie that was meant to be 3D. It was like, well, this is a big movie. Well, why don't we just make it 3D? I think, that, I think they were literally using like a big Samsung TV to just uh, make it 3D. If you're going to watch something decent and if you want to see the real Batman vs. Superman... Check out The Dark Knight Returns. It's an, an animated feature. There's two parts, part one and part two. Amazing, amazing mm. storytelling. You will thoroughly enjoy it. Find a way to watch it. That's And when you watch that, I would probably recommend watching it after this movie because if you watch it first and then you watch Batman vs. Superman, it's a very tough act to follow. But definitely find time. If you are a Batman fan in any way, uh, Batman, what is it? The Dark Knight Returns. And in the first part... He's actually pulling, Batman is pulling off MMA moves. He's pulling off arm bars, knee bars, doing all this crazy stuff. So you'll definitely yeah. enjoy it. And for people who are wondering, that was actually for, by Frank Miller and one of the inspirations behind Christopher Nolan's movies. And in this movie, the only thing they really took from it was the fact that they ripped off pretty much Batman's outfit and maybe his symbol, maybe his car. But that was, that was about it. Nothing to do with the plot. So definitely check that out. And, you know, Cass, just quickly as we wrap up, I've had a few people approach me when it, when they saw my sour grapes about the movie and say that, hey, at least it's not as bad as uh, Batman and Robin and Superman Returns. No, disagree. And it, to me, it's like, look, you can't do a Batman and Robin in this day and age because obviously mm. everybody would be like, this is ridiculous. But this is the equivalent to me of Batman and Robin because – it is just absolutely terrible. And I've had people approach me say, look, it was a fun ride. To me, it wasn't a fun ride at all. I'd be happier if this movie was never made. I'd be happier if yeah. these Christopher Nolan movies were the last traces of Batman. I'm not happy that, you know, we're going to have Ben Affleck play Batman and pretty much destroy the hard work that Christopher Nolan had to do after Batman and Robin and Batman Forever to make him a hero that's credible in people's lives. So to all those people that say, who cares? It's just a movie. We can watch it. We can enjoy the ride. It does a lot of harm, I feel like, for the image of Batman and what every all the hard work that all the great comic book writers, all the great animators and Christopher Nolan did to make him credible again in the people's eyes. Yeah, I feel like Batman was a joke after Batman and Robin and then Christopher Nolan built it up again and now he's a joke again. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, massively, <laughs> I'm, I'm massively disappointed. But, you know, as with all reviews, to cap it off, we've got to give a rating. I'm giving it... Half my my lowest ever half a Timothy Johnson mustache. I would give it zero, and I was seriously contemplating it. But I really respect the amount of work that Henry Cavill and the other guy Ben Affleck put into <laughs> actually getting into shape. I mean, they look the part. If nothing else, I can respect that. I'm giving it half a Timothy Johnson mustache. You, Dennis? 
Yeah, I'll give it half a mustache, and um, I'll say it was a monstrosity. It was, you know, heard the brand, heard the characters, and I am not looking forward to seeing the Justice League movie that's going to have Cyborg in it. And what about, yeah, there's a scene with Aquaman, just looks absolutely ridiculous. I know you guys are expecting to see him, but just don't, don't keep your hopes up. And also don't stick around after the credits because this isn't a Marvel movie and they're not going to have anything extra at the end, just to put a cherry on top of everything. Yeah, the Usher literally told us, and that was his exact words, it says this ain't a Marvel movie. And after watching Deadpool and now watching this, Jesus Christ, don't, yeah. We'll, we'll stick to Deadpool and, and Marvel any day. Those fuck Marvel t-shirts that all the cast are wearing, Margot Robbie, Ben Affleck, Henry Cavill, and uh, the other guy, 30 Seconds to Mars. Leno, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jared Leto. Jared Leto. Yeah, they can go return those shirts. It's like when uh, John Jones beat DC and he said, all those Break Bones shirts, you can go and return them. <laughs> yeah, those fuck Marvel shirts that they were all wearing so proudly and we all had a laugh about, you can go return them because I'm sticking with Marvel. And I think at this point, we've been talking about the movie for about 20 minutes. So in, in the name of remaining a show that talks about MMA, we'll leave it there. Um, but that's pretty much us for another week. Again, thank you so much, guys, for listening. A massive thank you to all our guests, Luke Thomas, who we just got off the, the not the phone, the Skype with, uh, Dan Kelly, Jake Matthews, Richard Perez, Juliana Pena. Thank you to all of them for joining us. Um, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. Hit us up on Twitter at Submission AUS for anything that you want to let us know. Facebook.com forward slash Submission Radio AUS. We have completely different content there. And if you're feeling super generous, give us a review on iTunes. Um, until then, we'll see you guys next week. 